So thank you very much for coming. Welcome to the University of New Hampshire School of Law and our town hall on the future of regulated sports gambling in New England. I'd like to thank all of you for making the trip to our school. And for those of you who are watching the live stream, thank you for doing so. It should be a great day ahead. I want to begin by thanking the people who are most responsible for putting, putting this event together. And leading off that list is Daniel Wallach. Dan has been, as many of you know, a transformative figure in sports gambling and the law. And Dan and I have partnered on a new online program at our school on sports integrity. We're offering a certificate. And we have at least one student who was here from the certificate program. It's obviously a very exciting time in this industry. I'd also like to thank Mary O'Malley and AJ Kirstead. Both Marion and AJ have been in instrumental in the logistics of this event and making it all flow together. So today we will have three excellent panels on sports betting and the law as a general topic, and also how the Supreme Court's decision in Murphy versus NCAA last year was a turning point in the topic, where the Supreme Court ruled that the federal ban on sports betting is unconstitutional, thereby allowing each state the opportunity to decide whether and how to legalize sports betting. And there are many issues that go into that decision. We know that eight states, including, of course, Nevada, which has had legalized sports betting since 1949, have now made sports betting legal. 23 other states are contemplating the decision. One of them is our state, New Hampshire, which is looking into the possibility of having legalized sports gambling. And the questions of whether to legalize is certainly instrumental in the discussion, but I think the next topic of how to legalize and what does that mean? Who can offer a game? How are games monitored? How is integrity ensured? Under what devices can one place a wager? Where do those wagers go? Certainly the issue of the Wire Act will come up today in terms of its relationship to the topic. So I hope that our panels are excellent and informative, and we also hope that each of you participates. There will be time for questions from every member of the audience, if you so choose, and it will be a great opportunity for many of you to meet each other as well. There will be a reception following the, the event, and I know many of you will be attending it. So without further ado, I'd now like to introduce our amazing dean, Dean Megan Carpenter. Dean Carpenter became the dean of the law school a couple of years ago, and she has led the school to a rankings increase. We're now top five in intellectual property in the law. We are also a top 100 school, and maybe even most importantly, our employment rate. We're fifth in the country if you exclude jobs funded by law schools. We have, if you look at the combination of employment and bar passage, we're really at the top among New England states, and sorry to those who aren't uh, from our school. But a lot of that has to do with great leadership, and that leader is Megan Carpenter, who I will now turn over. Thank you so much. I, I would be remiss if I didn't say it's too bad that U.S. News doesn't rank sports law programs because in that we are truly number one <laughs> nationwide. And that's thanks to, to Dean McCann. Um, he is, you know, I like to think that um, I'm often talking about our faculty that, that they don't just talk the talk, that they walk the walk. And that is absolutely true of of Mike McCann. He is not just thinking about issues related to sports law all the time and, and writing groundbreaking pieces on it. He really is at the front lines, at the cutting edge, um, both academically and creating you know, incredible new programs like the Sports Wagering and Integrity Certificate with students participating from across the country um, and providing the same for our students, our JD students here. Um, but also, you know, spending late nights or maybe early mornings sort of around the clock um, writing and exploring the legal issues that occur in the world of sports on a, on a daily basis. So I'm really grateful to him for everything he does for the school 
and um, the program that he has created here from scratch. Um, I'd like to introduce Charlie McIntyre right now. Um, he's executive director of the New Hampshire Lottery. Um, and he's also past president of the North American State and Provincial Lotteries and current vice president of the Multi-State Lottery Association. Um, before he decided to get cool and live free or die, um, he was south of the border um, in Massachusetts as assistant executive director and general counsel for the Massachusetts State Lottery um, from 2003 to 2010. Um, and then before joining the Massachusetts Lottery, he was a senior prosecutor in, in Massachusetts. And I think your bio says that you were working in organized crime. And I take that from the prosecutor standpoint, not the actual engaged in organized crime. Then it was hard to tell sometimes. Mr. McIntyre received his undergraduate degree from Connecticut College and also his law degree from Suffolk, for which we forgive him. If, I'm sure if you could go back in time, you would do it a little differently. Yeah. <laughs> and um, he's also a, a former competitive triathlete, completing three Ironman triathlons, including one, um, the, the World Championship, right, in, in Hawaii. Not too shabby of a place. To go. Um, so I also want to say that, you know, importantly for our discussion today, Director McIntyre is leading the charge for all state lotteries nationwide by filing the first and the only lawsuit challenging the U.S. Department of Justice's recent reinterpretation of the Federal Wire Act as now extending to all forms of gaming, not sports betting, which had been the longstanding interpretation. This case is going to be heard in New Hampshire Federal Court on, on April 11th, and we all look forward to following that. We're also truly honored to have him as an adjunct professor as part of our UNH Law Sports Wagering and Integrity Certificate program I was talking about earlier, providing education in this space to lawyers and, and non-lawyers alike. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're truly honored to have you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dean Carper, for that wonderful introduction, uh, and thanks for the school for hosting me and Dan for allowing me to be part of this program. So about two weeks ago, I'm in Dublin Airport, and I don't know if you folks have been there or know about it, but you go through customs coming back to the U.S. in actually Dublin. And I'm in line, and I go, uh, Mr. McIntyre, you have been selected for special s treatment. And I said to the guy, I go, so apparently this is what, what happens when you sue the Justice Department. <laughs> and he looked at me quizzically. I said, no, no, I, I, I sued your boss or the boss to your boss to your boss. And so he said, no, no, I don't understand. And I hearkened back to a time when I indeed was on the other side of the fence. At least I was in law enforcement. And I didn't toss the plane coming from Dublin. So I knew the drill. Um, and it's remarkable because New Hampshire is now in large measure the epicenter for the gambling world. Uh, it is the first state folks think of now, which is remarkable given that our size. Um, and the fight we engaged in is not based on some hubris. It's based on a very fundamental principle that the issue of gambling has always been a state decision. Whether a state wants to engage in the process or not, Utah has no lawful gambling. Zero point zero. I would up point out that the number one retailer for lottery tickets in Idaho happens to be on the Utah border. I'm sure it's coincidence. But some other states like New Jersey and Nevada have very robust gaming presences, and that's a decision by the states. And really, when you look at the case that was filed by New Hampshire, it's really that the state of New Hampshire decided to have internet products, internet lottery tickets available. The legislature decided on it, the governor signed it, and it became law. So that decision has always been a state decision. And certainly, the process by where the opinion of the Wire Act 2018 occurred, that process versus the process of 2011. 2011, the Illinois Lottery and the New York Lottery specifically sent requests to the Justice Department for opinions, and that was the 2011 basis. 2018, 
we found out about it when we first read it in the paper. So that was certainly surprising. I would be remiss if I did not um, introduce my, well, technically co-plaintiff, uh, the New Hampshire Lottery Commission Board Chairman, Deborah Douglas, who is with us here today. Um, with her support and with the support of the governor and the Attorney General of New Hampshire, we actually were the ones to first to file suit. And 14 states joined us in amicus briefs or intervening or the like. And if you think about it, states like Vermont and Mississippi both joined on. I mean, they don't agree on much, right? Let's be honest here. It's, you know, Vermont and Mississippi. But certainly in this area, they did. And New Hampshire has a proud history. So we were the first modern lottery in the U.S. In 1964, we started selling tickets. We were enacted in 63. And so this is the first ticket that was sold. It was sold to John King, who at the time was the governor of the state. He didn't win. Uh, and it's been in our conference room for a number of years. And the funding always goes to education, has for those last 55 years. Ironically, the first money to fund the Department of Education for New Hampshire was from the lottery. Previously, it was locally funded only. But our history goes back even further than that. And our good friends at one of our gaming vendors have a library. And this is um, the first lottery ticket sold in New Hampshire. Uh, this was from 1795. Uh, Dartmouth College was funded by a lottery. Um, actually, it was not one, it was 14. Um, so our commitment to education goes back, obviously, centuries. The first ticket was $3. Anyone care to guess how much that is in today's dollars? It's about 25 bucks. So the first series of tickets was a $25 purchase for $3. And... Um, you know, we say commission, it really acts as a board. Uh, my lottery commission acts as a board of directors. Deborah is our chairman. And we act more than just lottery. We actually regulate fantasy sports. We regulate bingo. We regulate charitable gambling rooms. We regulate and oversee um, horse wagering and simulcast wagering. Uh, we handle all legal bets, which I guess is why we're here, because of the illegal ones. Um, as a prosecutor, my favorite way to get into organized crime was through bookmakers. They had to use a phone, and in Boston, they had to pay a gratuity to somebody. They actually had to pay rent for doing business. Um, and it was prevalent. You know, show hands who's ever placed a bet on a sports game, who's ever played in a bracket pool, an NCAA bracket tournament, football squares, even betting cards, which I grew up in Quincy outside Boston. They were remarkably common there. Um, and so it was like prohibition. And um, I'll give you an example. I was on a wiretap of one of the biggest organized crime figures inside, outside Boston. And on my desk, it's in March, I get a copy of the bracket pool. Blank. I know what this is for. The office is having a pool for the NCAA tournament. Now I realize full well that I don't have to explain to the defense bar how I've indicted their client, clients for sports betting when indeed my office had a pool. So I had to go back and explain to the folks, uh, this has to die now, folks. I can't have this. Um, and the defense bar was able to tell me not the DA's office who won, but the AG's office who won the bracket pool. Such is the prevalence of the activity in question. And further how prevalent it is, um, it was the subject of a number of Boston Herald columns, but we raided a bookmaker and organized crime figure. And He's sitting there as, if you've ever been on a wiretap or a, a, a search warrant raid, you give the warrant to the person and say, great, have a seat. You can stay here. You can't do anything. You can't move, but you can watch us. And so it's Sunday. The game's on. The games are all going on. And the trooper starts answering the phone because this is evidence of a crime that they're placing. And he starts giving out lines on games. And he's wrong. He's giving out the wrong line. He's like, oh, Georgetown by 10. And it's... The other team by 10. And so, they're, and so the bookie starts yelling at him, for the love of God, I have to make good on those bets. You have to give it, give it the right line, please. <laughs> and that's one of the benefits about sports betting, legislation about sports betting, coming out of the shadows into the, into the light. The activity has been largely underground for decades. What's wagered legally is a tip of the iceberg that is waged illegally. You're talking somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 to I've heard is high, a number of $400, $400 billion per year. And so regulation makes sure everyone gets paid. 
I tell stories, my staff gets bored of this, but I tell stories all the time. I get a call because I'm the sports betting organized crime prosecutor for the region when I was younger. Guy calls me and says, I, I didn't get paid this on this bet. I said, okay, first, I need to explain to you Miranda versus Arizona. And I need to give you Miranda warnings because you've just admitted to me you committed a crime. And he won $8,000 parlay from a shop in Barbados, which used to be prevalent, probably still are. And I explained to him like, after, like, I'm sorry, it's gone. He goes, well, I want you to prosecute them. I said, I'm sorry, sir. Once you work outside the bounds of the law, you lose the protection of it. So I'm sorry, sir, and I promise not to prosecute you, but please don't be so stupid again to admit the crime to a law enforcement again. And that's one of the reasons for us is to make sure everyone gets paid. The transparency of the state government is complete. If you folks want to or any citizen in the state wants to see my emails, wants to see my phone calls, they have a right. Every letter I send is public record. Uh, and that allows for a transparency and an operation of business. Everyone knows, at least if you gamble in New Hampshire, you know where our office is. You know you can come to us and say, I have a complaint. That will be taken seriously. Illegal conduct doesn't have that level of consumer protection. Um, and certainly for us, we look forward for it to being a dependable source of revenue like the lottery has. Um, this past year, we passed our major milestone. We, we just tra crossed $2 billion in revenue since we started. It's been an important funding source for New Hampshire education. And certainly as a state agency, we enjoy the oversight of both the legislature and the governor on a regular basis, certainly answerable to them on a moment's notice. So um, sports betting for us has always been the next phase. If you think about it, a bracket pool, and if you think about a, a squares for the Super Bowl, those are essentially lottery products. And now that they're regulated, now that they're transparent as to how they occur, they can be in the sh outside the shadows, within, you know, and everyone gets a fair product. That's what we're there for. So uh, I thank you for this opportunity, uh, Dean. With the Dean. Oh, Dean, I'm sorry, Dean Carpenter. Uh, and look forward to the rest of the panels. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Paul Sternberg. I am a representative of Spectrum Gaming, a senior lottery consultant. I'm filling in, excuse me, filling in for Joe Wynett. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it, so they asked me to fill in for him. And I was very excited because I believe that the lotteries in most states should be the ones who are running iGaming, but more importantly, sports betting. I think they can deliver it with integrity. When you look at surveys of lotteries across the country and public perception, they're always the highest rated, the higher rated than government officials, casinos. They're usually in the 70 percentile or higher, so they have a lot of public trust in them. And that's very important when it comes to gaming, because without integrity, you don't have a product. So I'm very happy to be part of this panel. I've worked with Charlie before, Jerry Auburn, who I call the Dean of Lottery Directors. Uh, Mark, I've worked with and actually will be on a board with him shortly. And also Representative Lang, who I'll let talk shortly because he had a momentous day yesterday. He sponsored a bill, uh, which is great to have an ally in the legislature who sees the value of the lottery and how well they can do it. I'll tell one quick story about Charlie so you know he's telling the truth. <laughs> when I was at the Mass Lottery, Charlie and I had a wall between our offices. And there was actually a basketball pool going on, and Charlie, as a general counsel, put a stop to it. I can tell you that he wasn't very popular, but he had to put a stop to it. So he has done that before he is telling players, the truth. Players never are. Yes, exactly. <laughs> learn, that, um, learn that now. Yes. So what I'm going to try to do is go through our questions, and hopefully we'll have time at the end for questions from the audience. Um, I will start with Director Arvin, who I've known, and he's the longest serving director, I believe, in the country from Rhode Island, have a lot of respect for him, worked with him in Lucky for Life, as well as other aspects of the lottery industry. And let me put my glasses on. I don't know if I should be that proud of that, that I'm the longest serving director. <laughs> <laughs> it's a major, when the usual, the average lottery director serves probably about 18 months to 24 months. So, Jerry, how long have you been? Uh, 23 years. So that says a lot what a great job he's doing and how well he's respected in the industry. And also, Charlie and Jerry are also in the Hall of Fame, the Lottery Hall of Fame, which is a great honor. They, I wanted to mention that as well. Um, to Director Arvin, how did it come about that the lottery, as opposed to licensed for profit operators, are operating sports betting in Rhode Island? Well, Paul, uh, by Rhode Island Constitution, all gaming has to be operated. And it's very clear that the word operate is in our Constitution. 
by state government. Now, that does not say the lottery, but shall be operated by government. Thus, in 1973, 74, when the lottery started, uh, all gaming was put initially under the lottery and has uh, thus since done that. We, in 1992, we expanded to taking over, uh, allowing video lottery terminals in two of our casinos, uh, followed about five years ago, uh, tables uh, in, in uh, one initially, and then uh, a year ago, we did our second uh, casino allowing tables. We t totally oversee and operate those facilities. So it was clear that when uh, sports betting passed our legislature and signed by a governor, that it was going to be under the control of the lottery. Okay, thank you. And then, as I, remembered, I mentioned, Representative Lang, who sponsored a bill, which I believe the vote was yesterday. It and was. It, and what was the turnout of that vote? Uh, it was a three to one over, uh, overwhelming vote to pass the bill, 300 and something to 80 something, I think it was. Well, that's phenomenal. And what made you decide to sponsor the bill, and how did you feel about it, and why you thought the lottery should be the instrument to actually? So the SCOTUS decision was obviously the impetus for, for the conversation. Uh, former Representative Bill Ohm. Uh, and I served on Ways and Means together uh, last term, and so we had an interest in gaming. Charlie is a regular in front of our committee, unfortunately. Um, and so uh, once that decision came out, Bill and I started engaging with Charlie right away with starting to talk about language and how it would fit within the structure in New Hampshire. Okay, thank you. Um, to Director McIntyre, as we asked Director Arvin, what do you see the advantages of having the lottery operate sports betting as opposed to the state gaming licenses to private for profit? Well, it certainly is to Representative Lang's. Um, one of the unique situations in New Hampshire is, is that we're so much more accountable to the legislature than we are, certainly, that we were in Massachusetts. Uh, in Massachusetts, the head of the lottery reports to a joint legislative committee on House and Senate Ways and Means once as to an aspect of revenues, reports once as to an uh, aspect of finances, and then never walks in the building again. Whereas uh, Representative Lang will know. I, we are in the state house during this session. Oh, it's if it's not daily, it's more than daily. And certainly, there's a comfort level in terms of our operations, and also there's a level of control that the legislature knows that they have with us, in terms of if it if it goes too far, if we run too fast with the scissors, uh, we'll be called in and sort of asked to say, no, bring that back, do this and this. And so, I, I think some level it was a matter of trust in terms okay. of the last years we've done what legislators have asked and no more, and we have been successful at what they've given us. Uh, we launched two new products last year, uh, Kino as well as iGaming. Uh, the iGaming launch, I think, is the most successful iGaming launch in the U.S. in terms of per capita sales. Uh, and so those aspects certainly lend itself towards, okay, they're doing all of the gambling now and it's doing pretty well. Yep. We trust them with it. Which is great, a great track record. Yeah. Lotteries speak for themselves. Um, and I'd also to like to add Mike Sweeney is here, who is the executive director in Massachusetts. And in Massachusetts, they don't have iGaming, which Charlie has now, and he's doing a great job with it. And they also, as they say, do not have sports betting. I know it's up for debate. Uh, in Massachusetts, the legislature has to, and I'll let Mike talk about that, but the legislature has to approve it and decide who's going to get it. And in my opinion, Mike, the lottery deserves it from being a former executive director there to how well they operate everything. And also, the most important thing is, if the lottery is running it, the profits are going to go directly back to the state. There are no shareholders. The most money will be generated and sent back to the state if the lotteries, lotteries are the ones who are running sports gaming. Um, I just wanted to add that. Even not, Paul, yeah. I yeah. certainly think there's an opportunity, like sort of the way Jerry's model is, there's an opportunity for us to sort of be the operator, but certainly to contract out aspects of it so that the, the, the profitability as well as the, the operation is done yeah. with the best of the methods. And that's a great point. Some lotteries are more capable than others. Um, you may license a DraftKings or may license one of the casino operators to come in and operate it for you as well. So that's, but what I'm saying, the lottery should be yeah, the one who oversees exactly. it. So, uh, Mark Hicker, who was at the end, is involved in the litigation. I'm not sure what you can and cannot talk about. So if I ask something inappropriate, please feel free, which I usually do, tell me not to. Thank you. Um, uh, Mark, um, does a new opinion have any effect on sports betting in the United States? Well, as, as was mentioned earlier, uh, the, the Wire Act always applied to sports betting, and that was uh, the one thing that I think there was heated agreement on. Uh, but uh, the opinion that came out in January also held and or made it expressly clear that the, 19, uh, the 2006 Unlawful Internet Gambling Enforcement Act uh, does not amend the Wire Act. Now, to most people in this room, you probably knew that already because the 
The UGA makes clear that it doesn't uh, amend uh, or affect any other state or federal law. But nevertheless, in the gaming industry, there was a feeling that the UGA presented a spirit of Congress in that it allowed or it, it carved out an exception for intrastate uh, gaming that was conducted under certain circumstances where there was geolocation, uh, where there was uh, specific provisions to prevent underage gaming, where there was data control. And so there was a view uh, held by many that this, uh, although it did not expressly amend the Wire Act, uh, that, that Congress intended uh, that the UGA uh, create a spirit that the Wire Act, if it was uh, if sports betting was contained entirely within a state, uh, that the intermediate routing of bets outside the state uh, would uh, be a, uh, a foul but no harm. Uh, that was sort of the view, and it was an, uh, a well, it was known that in Nevada, for example, where there is legal mobile sports betting, that sometimes the bets would travel across state lines before returning into the state. And there was never a problem from the view of regulators or law enforcement with that. So now uh, there is, first I think there's uncertainty uh, as to what the opinion uh, means. And hopefully it won't, uh, through Charlie's efforts and the New Hampshire uh, Attorney General and New Hampshire Lottery's efforts, hopefully it will be a short-lived uh, opinion, but uh, there is uncertainty that uh, because of the express language of the opinion, there's uncertainty as to what it means with respect to intermediate routing of sports bets, which means where the bets begin and end within the state, but may, due to the technical aspects of cell technology or satellite technology or internet communication, they may travel outside the borders. And just to follow up on that, uh, the ruling that just came out that they're all talking about and that Charlie has filed suit on, that also affects lotteries in general because lottery bets are either done through the, uh, through the satellite or cellular and you have no idea from the bet when it's taken it at the retailer and bounces back to the back end and then back again. We have no idea where it could be going out of space, it could be going over state lines. So that is a problem with that ruling. It was so broad what they came up with. It basically, if you interpret it literally, you could actually outlaw lotteries, which I assume wasn't the intent, but it's a problem. And that's why it's so important that Charlie has filed this suit and has 14 states on board with it with an amicus brief. Um, if, you, if you look at the amicus yeah. brief, even the, the number of states that would have also joined, if the internal processes were not so complicated, the number would have been significantly higher. Yes. Because of the tight time for the suit and the fact that we asked for an expedited hearing on the matter, the number of states was was limited, but even that we still had 14 or 15 join us, um, which, which were was obviously a, very helpful. Very which was grateful. amazing because it was done so quickly. Yeah. I mean, it was been two or three day period. They all jumped on board, and normally you have to go through the attorney general's office in your state, depending how the reporting structure is. So to get 14 states, as Charlie said, that's a major number, and yeah. probably more would have been on board. It was just such a short time frame they couldn't get everything done. Um, Jerry Auburn. Uh, what do you see as the advantages of having a lottery operate sports betting as opposed to the state granting, li granting licenses to for-profit operations? Well, I, I concur with Charlie. Uh, you know, we have integrity. We've been so long established and, and uh, respected by the citizens of our state uh, that I feel they feel very comfortable. Uh, I hear time and time again, and we do have sports betting going on in Rhode Island right now, that we have these extraordinary long lines, uh, at least during Super Bowl time, uh, these people were probably placing, maybe put placing, placing bets illegally prior to that or offshore, but they have found it now. They can come out of the shadows and now be able to, to place a legal bet wager in the state. Uh, I feel that, uh, you know, as Charlie said, it was very transparent, the lottery. We, our records are totally open. Uh, we, uh, we expose all to uh, whoever asks. And the fact of the trust and integrity is uh, far most, the most important. I'm going to ask you another quick question, Jerry. Um, how did you get up so quickly? I mean, it was amazing to see how fast and how nimble the Rhode Island Lottery was to be up and running. Nimble, I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> fast, yes. Uh, well, back in December prior to, to past, but this is back in 17, I guess, we, uh, uh, that uh, we started looking at this, and we actually started developing an RFP. And we put an RFP out before it was even rescinded over to it. And uh, we then moved very aggressively, again, just in our two facilities, our two casinos, uh, that they had to 
actually uh, allow sports betting in, in those places. So in November, we actually uh, started the wages after the, the World Series, thankfully, because I think we would have lost a lot of money on the World Series, <laughs> but unfortunately pr prior to the Super Bowl. Uh, and uh, we've learned some lessons as a result of that. But uh, uh, we, we partnered with IGT and William Hill as our sports book. Uh, we were, it was a little challenging at first because there was no other uh, states in the country to look to, to, to even to develop the RFP. So it was challenging in that sense. And we, we actually uh, reached over to Europe with William Hill and uh, got some uh, very good some consultants to help us through it, through the process. Uh, so uh, our next step is to, uh, we, and we did it in phases, Paul. We only did it initially face-to-face uh, -face with Atella uh, at the facilities. Uh, tomorrow morning we start kiosks uh, in the facilities. Uh, and followed by, uh, in right now, in our state, uh, Senate and House has passed uh, statewide mobile. Uh, so we anticipate the governor signing that bill, and we hopefully will be up and running by the fall on wow. mobile. That's great. Um, Representative Lang, the bill, would, the bill that just passed would not only allow betting on college sports events played in the state, would not allow betting on uh, college sports in the state, but will allow betting in New Hampshire sports teams playing outside the state. Could you comment on this? Sure. So there was an amendment to that that yeah, got yeah. passed oh, through okay. in this last one. Yeah. So it allows for, if it, if it should ever happen, that New Hampshire colleges are participating in tournaments, yeah. uh, NCAA or whatever else, tournaments, that those bets would be allowed in tournament-based. But on a one-on-one, -on -one, just one-off game, um, the goal was not to allow that. New Hampshire is a fairly small state, and having access to students is not that difficult. I had, I had dinner with some of the basketball team at UNH over in Durham. So yeah. the idea was is we wanted to restrict that kind of access to make sure there were no shenanigans that could potentially happen and right. have any kind of those. So we felt it was best to just cut it off at the knees, make no, sure it couldn't happen. Very wise choice. Yes. No uh, Charlie, um, how many brick-and-mortar agents do you envision if sports gaming comes into reality? <clears throat> I mean, certainly, um, it'll be more of a market-based decision. I would imagine it, it depends on the, my neighbors. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm certainly not Rhode Island. We're good, Jerry. Uh, <laughs> Although we have a lot of New Hampshire plates in our, in no, our yeah. I, I saw firsthand when I visited, um, in all candor, the lotteries, we share lots of information. And so... When I visited um, Jerry Albin a couple weeks ago in Rhode Island, we visited the sports book there, saw the license plates, who was driving to Twin Rivers to play, and who was in the who was in the sports book playing there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and honestly, part of the discussion we had with Representative Lang related to entry into tournaments was a direct result of my conversation with Jerry about you don't want to stop a tournament just because one state happens to make it into the you know right. they win their league and they're a 15 seed likely to lose to a two seed, you don't want to block the entire tournament. Without, we won't take action on that game, obviously, right. but the overall tournament. Um, but, oh, I'm sorry, what was the question again? Oh, just how many brick and mortar? Oh, yes, yeah, so yeah, market base. That. I'm yeah. sorry, market base. So yeah. uh, if Maine and Vermont would have passed such, um, it will depend. And if Mass doesn't or does, that will depend. Uh, we often suggest that if there's a donut hole on the very southern border of New Hampshire, on the top of that donut would be 600,000 people. On the bottom of that donut would be 1.5 million. Okay. So um, I, I use this line all the time: is that um, retail behavior doesn't care about geography. No. If a, you cross, you know, a liquor store sell 500 some million dollars in gross revenues in liquor because the prices are so markedly cheaper, and so a lot of our customers half, I think, half their revenues are out of state. So okay. similarly, depending on what they do, depending on what the market would bear. Okay. And think. quick question for you, Jerry. Um, are you seeing a lot of cross-border sales? Are you seeing Massachusetts, New Hampshire, or Connecticut uh, people crossing over to play? We, right we did. We did extraordinary numbers of out-of-state uh, players, uh, more so during the Super Bowl, and we're starting to see that right now with March Madness. We, we anticipate tomorrow to be extremely busy, very similar to what we saw the Saturday uh, before Super Bowl Sunday, uh, fr the Friday and Saturday. Uh, so we're going to be running this for about two or three weeks uh, time. Uh, once the, once the brackets were selected, uh, we didn't we saw a small uptick yesterday, but the and today and the numbers will be strong tomorrow. So to answer the question, yes, a lot from Massachusetts right. and and uh, New Hampshire and, and Connecticut. Right, because I've seen a lot of from being from Massachusetts, I see a lot of advertising for Twin Rivers and your other facility mm -hmm. about that. So, all right. Um, to Mark at the end, let me just find my question for you, Mark. I don't want to be forgotten about. Um, uh, are lotteries conducting sports betting in other U.S. states, and does that surprise you? Obviously, we know that Jerry is doing it. 
or what other jurisdictions are doing it? We know. Well, it, I am surprised that the uh, lotteries have uh, taken a leadership role. I'm pleased also for the reasons that uh, Charlie and Jerry have mentioned that the lotteries are, uh, have been selected in uh, uh, West Virginia is, is a state where uh, you know, the lotteries are uh, uh, in charge of monitoring uh, sports betting there. Uh, and uh, you know there are uh, a number of bills pending where the uh, uh, the lottery would also uh, be um, uh, in charge of uh, of monitoring, if not operating. Delaware, for example, is another uh, state where the lottery uh, oversees the sports betting. Delaware has been uh, conducting sports betting uh, of a type uh, for longer uh, than. Uh, for many years because they were one of the states that was accepted out of the uh, Professional and Amateur Sports uh, Protection Act uh, because they were conducting a form of sports betting before uh, the enactment of that lab. But it was only a parlay bets that they would accept and now they uh, have uh, full-on sports betting. Uh, what, I, what I do think is, is particularly unique about lotteries conducting sports betting though is that you know, you can actually have a bad day uh, with sports betting, as opposed to a lottery where I, uh, you know, if you, as all these experienced lotteries do, you conduct it correctly, uh, you're you're always going to win. Uh, but but bookies can get it wrong uh, on occasionally, so lotteries have to uh, adjust, and they've adjusted very nimbly to, the, uh, with the uh, help I think of other industry experts. Uh, as, as Jerry mentioned, William Hill, but it's, it certainly is possible uh, in sports betting, unlike most other uh, forms of, of gaming, that uh, uh, the house can lose. Uh, but over time, uh, if it's done correctly, uh, the uh, you know, sports betting is a, uh, uh, a profitable endeavor for the, uh, for the bookmaker if they're, if they're running it correctly. Okay, thank you. I'd be remiss if I didn't bring this up, and this goes to either Jerry or Charlie or both of you. Um, responsible uh, gaming, which is a core value of all lotteries across this nation, have you put safeguards in place or done anything to address to make sure that people don't fall in or get trapped into a problem? Um, and if there is, they do end up having a problem or develop a problem, there's a way to help them? Yeah. Which either, either I mean, one certainly for Certainly for us, um, the sports betting language, Representative Lang, contains a um, currently a council for responsible gaming uh, that's fully funded, um, actually more than they asked for originally um, for funding mechanisms. And also our, our iLottery platform contains limits in terms of how much you can play and, and wager, and also contains a self-exclusion function that can't be undone. So for example, if you want to exclude yourself from our um, iLottery game uh, platform, um, you're excluded, and that ban lasts as long as you put it in for and can't be undone. So okay. certainly uh, we've had folks take advantage of that, and we certainly we don't want the stories that are a problem. Right. It's, it's, it's bad for our business. We want the vast majority that have no issues. We don't want the folks who have difficulty or, or problems. Yep. And, when, and it's very similar to what they're doing in New Hampshire. We're not, we're not mobile yet, uh, and once we do, the, the safeguards will be in place, very similar to limit the amount of time on the device, limit the amount of time amount you can wager, uh, you know, pop-ups to tell you, you know, you're, 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 you're maybe at a dangerous point, uh, and obviously the, the self-exclusion portion of that also. So it's very similar. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Lang, um, from reading the bill, unless it's changed from what I saw, the bill would allow up to 10 brick and mortar retail establishments, which could be uh, co-located with other commercial businesses or general commercial retail locations. Do you envision this to be an opportunity for bars and restaurants like Buffalo Wild Wings? So yeah, so when I when I first were looking at language, I was working with Charlie, we had just recently passed Keno. And when I talked to Charlie, we talked about making the sports betting bill in alignment with some of the same provisions as our Keno betting. So uh, things like local control, so towns have to have a say in whether or not they want to allow uh, retail sports lottery, uh, retail sports betting uh, locations. And so that was the first hurdle is the town has to say yes, and then if there's a, a location within the town, we want them to have that opportunity to be able to offer that. 
Um, to my knowledge, I, there was only one location out on the seacoast that's currently interested in doing that that actively came up to us and talked to me about the provision in the bill. Um, but uh, yeah, I, we felt it was an important part of, you know, New Hampshire is a big tourism state. So it's a big aspect of that, uh, bringing and making it a whole, you know, afternoon, if you will, um, hanging out and, uh, you know, enjoying the games, enjoying meals and betting on your favorite teams. Which is important, bringing in outside revenue other than from the state, which is very Correct. important. So, okay, thank you on that. Um, Jerry, um, as sports betting is considerably different type of gaming than traditional draw lottery games and scratch off tickets, how do the Rhode Island Lottery develop or acquire the necessary, necessary sports betting? And you answered some of this already, sports betting ex expertise. Yeah, and, and back to what Mark said, how, how different it is. It is yeah. totally different, and you have to have very thick skin and be prepared to lose a lot of money in any given day uh, and, and obviously make money, but in the long run, you're going to balance out. Uh, we did, uh, again, utilize this, the skills of Spectrum, and, uh, again, most of the information came from overseas. Uh, where Europe, they've been doing this for some time, and we use their expertise. And, and then, uh, you know, we got quickly, we learned, we sent people to Delaware, uh, although they were just doing parlays at the time, uh, parlay betting. We, we, you know, we, we had the assistance of the, the Delaware lottery. Uh, we also in, in, uh, started looking at New Jersey very closely, as well as Nevada, of course, which is, you know, you, you, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Nevada's been doing this for so long, uh, and their business model is very good. So uh, it was. It was a learning, a steep learning curve for all of us because we had we didn't know anything about sports betting, uh, but it, it is uh, it is doable. I assure you of that, and uh, uh, we feel very comfortable now. Even though each day we're learning something new, and we're taking there's a new chapter every 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 few weeks in our in our in our state and how we're progressing with the games, uh, and but there is the opportunity. Back to what Mark said, it's it's not like a scratch ticket. It's not a guarantee or a Powerball ticket where you're going to get guaranteed revenue. Um, you, there are going to be days that you, you lose an awful lot of money and have to be prepared for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark, could you explain the issues that have arisen between state legislatures and the professional sports leagues regarding royalty rights and exclusive data? data excuse me. Sure. Uh, the, um, the leagues in Nevada, uh, where sports betting has been going on for since 1949, uh, do not get compensated other than for the use of their uh, trademarks, okay. uh, which you may see if you go to Las Vegas and you sit in a sports pub and you're sitting in the Washington Redskins seat or the Patriots seat or so forth. Uh, but uh, with, the, uh, with state legislatures now considering sports betting, several states have already passed it. Uh, the leagues uh, initially were seeking uh, what they were referring to as an integrity fee uh, a, uh, a piece of the uh, total uh, handle, the total amount wagered. Uh, originally in Indiana, they were seeking uh, an amount of 1% of the uh, uh, total amount wagered, which would have translated in Indiana to about 24% uh, of the gross gaming revenue, which is revenue after payment of prizes. And the, uh, the leagues were justifying this uh, ask uh, saying that uh, we would need now, uh, with the expansion of sports betting, to put greater uh, effort uh, to uh, keeping the games clean. Uh, that reasoning was criticized that, well, the, you know, you should want to keep the games clean on your own, because if, the, if, if there was any suspicion that the games were not clean, you'd lose viewership, you'd lose advertisers, and so forth. So that characterization of the fee has morphed into a royalty, which is perhaps uh, uh, a more true uh, characterization that uh, the leagues want a piece of the action because, in their view, and this is certainly a fair characterization, it's their product. Uh, and their view is that if there, if, if there weren't NBA games, there would be no betting on NBA games. Same with football and, and baseball and so forth. And, uh, there's some irony to this because for so long the leagues were opposing sports betting and then the, then the Supreme Court uh, strikes down the PASPA uh, last May and now they raise their hand and say, well, uh, we, you know, we'd, like a, we'd like a piece of the, uh, of the action. So there's, there's some irony there in New Jersey, which spent millions of dollars in, uh, in fees, legal fees and other, uh, otherwise, in an effort to uh, uh, bring their suit Remember that 
this was the second challenge, or perhaps the third challenge, the first time the Supreme Court did not denied cert, and the second time they granted it to the surprise of many. So New Jersey was having nothing to do with uh, the League's request uh, for um, uh, an integrity fee or royalties. And so far, to my knowledge, although Dan uh, is certainly more uh, uh, expert on this than I am, but to my knowledge, no uh, state legislature has passed, or there's no, uh, there's no sports bill yet that has been enacted that grants uh, a royalty to the, uh, uh, to the leagues. But I, uh, they are back. I, I would be very interested in your uh, experience, but uh, uh, you know, they are certainly uh, seeking uh, a participation. Uh, and, and I agree with you, your opinion, and one of the things I find ironic is if the leagues are making an integrity fee, integrity fee or they're making something off of sports wagering, my issue would be, and I think a lot of people would agree, if let's say a game comes down to the last minute and whether it's a shot or a field goal or something is missed and it throws a line one way or the other, the league has nothing to do with it, but it brings their integrity into question that they have something to do with it because you always hear people say the games are fixed, they want it to go seven games, and people always say that. However, if they're making money off it, it brings that into the question even though it's not true. So it's better, in my opinion, just to be clean. They're going to make their money off of advertising revenue, increased viewership, and I think that's where they benefit from. I understand the point, but I think they benefit just from being sports gaming and people being allowed to wager on games. We'll have more interest in TV, broadcast rights, and things along those lines. I don't know if any of you have a comment on that or? Well, I agree with you, Paul. I, yeah. You know, they certainly, what we're seeing is they, they, they're embracing uh, the sports betting because they realize how much revenue they can generate just by more people, more viewers yeah. uh, on the games. Uh, it's keeping the younger demographics uh, engaged uh, and it's only going to grow in this country, you know, exponentially. And uh, there's obviously great opportunities for them to make much more money as a result of it. Uh, Representative Lang, was there any pressure at all or it didn't come up at all when you were writing the it bill? It didn't come up once in our committee at all and, right. or any, anywhere along the line in our bill that I was aware of. Oh, that's great because I know in D.C. they had a lot of issues. D.C. voted to allow the lottery to do sports gaming and there were certain leagues were looking for an integrity fee and there were a lot of issues over that. When all was said and done, the city, in their infinite wisdom, decided to not uh, pay any integrity fee but to allow the lottery to operate it and I guess negotiations are ongoing right now on that front. I mean, Paul, that, yep. I, would, I would expect the jurisdictions that have the most sports teams in the jurisdiction have the most issues. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like you're going to see a California where there are, what is it, teams. a dozen right. professional sports teams, they'll have more influence than right. so for New Hampshire where there are none. Uh, yep. Or D.C. has two, you know. I think to your point, uh, New York, which is the site of the headquarters mm -hmm. for yeah. some of the leagues, is, is of course. So getting some pressure. Yeah, I think they have 11 professional sports teams in New York State. Yeah. So you're going to, and they're a very large employer in the state, obviously, for that reason. So. Yeah. Yes. So. Um, Charlie, quick question. Will you be using an RFP process to select vendors? And can you explain how that will work, or if you formulated it, or you're not ready to talk about it? or? <coughs> I don't know, John. What are we doing? <laughs> Sorry. <I didn't> mean... <laughs> yeah, no, certainly. Uh, the language in the bill um, is there's an RFP process we'll do to find all of, of the vendors we would use for this purpose, just like yeah. we do now. Uh, we wouldn't do this in-house. It would be foolhardy to do it. Um, we would select appropriate vendors, and I use the word plural intentionally, um, to engage in this process. Um, our, our role in this is to sort of maximize revenue, um, regulate it appropriately and fairly, and uh, to the extent possible, uh, use it as a generator of economic growth for the state. Okay. So that's that'll be our three main goals. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Mark, um, and if you can comment on this again, what impact, if any, will the New Hampshire lottery lawsuit against the DOJ have on mobile sports betting throughout New England, throughout New England, excuse me, but isn't it just a case about lottery ticket sales? Or uh, well, I think that the uh, uh, the the lawsuit uh, hopefully will uh, be successful uh, and will uh, uh, clarify that the Wire Act applies only to sports betting, uh, and the uh, and again hopefully it will have nationwide effect uh, because as as Charlie's mentioned, uh, while New Hampshire is the leader in bringing the in the uh, suit, uh, there are a number of states. Uh, who are uh, uh, 
in support of, of that effort uh, and hoping that the uh, decision will come quickly and will be uh, 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 clear. Uh, but I do think that the, uh, uh, you know, the one need only look to Pennsylvania, which uh, responded to the uh, Wire Act decision and uh, changed their uh, policies with, re with vendors requiring them to bring all their equipment within the state, whereas prior to that they had uh, been more flexible and allowed vendors to uh, put servers in New Jersey. This is with respect to non-sports betting. Now with respect to sports betting, I think, again, we don't know, uh, but I think there may be increased scrutiny on uh, uh, what uh, the Wire Act provisions are. I do, however, uh, believe that uh, the issue of intermediate routing is a really thorny issue, and I think with technology uh, today, it would be, in my view, uh, unwise to uh, uh, enforce uh, the, uh, a view that intermediate routing violates the Wire Act, because it certainly wasn't the spirit of the Wire Act. If I could just take a second to re re tell you what you probably already remember is that the Wire Act was enacted to assist states uh, in enforcing their laws with respect to organized crime. It wasn't enacted to thwart states' gaming policies. And if the Wire Act is being used as a, uh, as a hurdle or as a speed bump to sports betting, that would be contrary to what its intended, intended uh, purpose was. Okay. Thank you. Um, Charlie, um, as you know, it, uh, HB, the House Bill 480, provides that you must be 18 years old, minimum age, to place a wager. Do you know if that's consistent across the country or what you've seen around the country? I, I don't. And certainly um, it was debated whether to go to 21 or 18, um, but the vast majority, I think the opinion was 18 was sufficient in terms of age um, the cutoff. Okay. Um, and 18 is what we, they went with. That's right, and that's what lottery is now. Yeah, it's what lottery is now. Uh, it's age control, and every one of our products um, is an age controlled environment and would be sold in an age controlled environment. Okay. So, um, and, you know, and we test and we check, and we, as you know, we, you know, we have a compliance department, we have investigators. If there are issues, we follow up and right. accordingly. Um, Representative Wang, was it a heated discussion or did it, what, 18 seem fine with people or were there a lot no, of No, because we projections? placed the regulation component underneath lottery, 18 was an accepted standard by, by the committee and by uh, most, most of the individuals I spoke to. Okay, great. Okay. All right. I'm just trying to think if I covered all my questions. Um, I'd like to open up for questions from the audience if anybody has any questions from the audience. Yeah, so uh, have you guys done any studies into the demographics of what a typical sports lottery participant or, or better would, would look like? I'm thinking age group, uh, social status, uh, income, for instance. What are we looking at in demographics? I can tell you what they look like. I can't say what their, demo their, their income is, though. Uh, I shouldn't say what they look like. That's very general. It, <laughs> but, it, but it does, does appear to be a between a third, heavily skewed between 30 and 50-year-old male, heavily. Uh, you know, what their economic, we, we have not done any research relative to that, though. But it does, I mean, very few females are in line uh, to place wages. What reason, we don't know. I mean, certainly we did research a number of years ago. We found an over-indexing for sports betting and lottery players. So if you like to gamble, you like to gamble. Um, and certainly we saw the same thing. We saw it skew male as well. Although the research is a little odd because, in theory, they were answering yes to a crime. Because at the time, sports betting was illegal, so they were answering a question that mm. they probably shouldn't have answered, but they did. And, and you, know, uh, you know, for my friend here, you know, <laughs> answer my friend. Um, but it's really the same experience. You saw it skew male 35, 55. The core lottery audience. The core lottery, the, your core lottery player. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes? Charlie, the representative Lang. Did you guys discuss the kiosks at regular retail locations, uh, or, or so 7-Elevens and that nature to put sports bets there? And have you also discussed mobile sports betting lots in New Hampshire, where people can drive across the border, sit in a parking lot, place their bet on their mobile phone, drive out of state again, and then cast their check back in? Well, certainly for the so our lottery platform currently uh, 
you can be in state and register. Uh, for example, I, our second biggest business in the state is tourism. So the lakes region fills up in the summer with folks enjoying the lakes and not the traffic of Boston. Um, and so you're through your phone able to play through that because the phone has a geolocation function which is hyper robust. So you know that the wager is being placed internally to the state. Whether or not you're a citizen of X or Y, you still can play like you can currently. You can be a citizen of Utah, play Powerball in New Hampshire if you're on vacation, cash your ticket and go back to Utah given by the sovereign law. Uh, so similarly, there's never thought to lots. It was more, if you're in state, you can legally conduct the business that the state allows you to conduct currently. So, yeah, that would be, this, so to talk about your retail location question, so yes, that was exactly the, the idea I had in my mind was the ability for, um, you know, poor locations or sports bars or that one to do those kind of things. It's, again, similar to the line of our Kino uh, model that we used was that once those, loca if, if the bill passed and things were going on, that they could make arrangements with the lottery to have those kind of kiosks if that was the way they chose to go. But we definitely didn't put it hard into the law because, again, we weren't projecting out what that was going to look like. And, uh, you know, Charlie's point, you know, it was a heated discussion about geofencing and about making sure we can make sure that the transaction begins and enters uh, or ends in, in the state of New Hampshire. And I think the technologies are definitely there as a technologist, um, as I do in my real job, um, that the geofencing is definitely there to allow that kind of functionality. Yeah. It'll be more of the Kino model as opposed to the vending machine model as we have the lottery ticket vending machines. Yeah, the yes. That would be my anticipation. Yeah, yeah. that's literally what, what's anticipated internally, yes. Yeah. Can you remind me if New Hampshire, Rhode Island, um, allows for uh, gaming with credit, on credit? We don't. Um, we all, um, our, our lottery platform uh, is debit, or it's equivalent. So like ACH, PayPal, those, yes, but not credit cards. No. Relative to the traditional lottery, we do allow credit debit. We don't get a lot of credit because the, the fee associated to it, so a lot of retailers will not take credit. Uh, you know, if someone's buying a Powerball ticket in a liquor store and spending eighty dollars on liquor, they, they will probably take the credit card. Uh, in our facilities right now for uh, for sports betting, we only allow cash. When we go mobile, we will allow debit, but not credit. And I will say that was a particular conversation that occurred on, on the bill that passed the House, and it specifically does not have credit in there. As Charlie said, all the other models are referenced, you know, PayPal and, and debit mm -hmm. card and cash. But we specifically excluded credit cards for that very reason. We're very, very concerned about credit cards. Yeah, I mean, it's cash, equi it's equivalent. Mm -hmm. Really, is what we're looking at. Yeah. And, Mark, I'm not sure if you would know this. Uh, I believe in Vegas and Atlantic City, you have to have cash when you go to place a wager. There is no credit card. It's cash. Yeah. cash. Some, yeah. as you know, some uh, high rollers get extended credit when they right. check in. Uh, they have an approved credit line they can draw down right. on. Right. So. Okay. All right. Yes? I know it's a thing of the past, but just out of curiosity, do you know what the rationale was behind Delaware only allowing parlay to think that just seemed weird? Well, oh, yeah, Mike would know that better, but yeah. yeah. Well, I can. The, they were there, were, there were several court cases that restricted them to uh, parlay betting, but the parlay betting was they were conducting that uh, during the windows that the Professional and Amateur Sports Protection Act provided when it was enacted in 1992. Uh, they made some efforts to go beyond parlay betting, and those were challenged by the NFL successfully. Uh, so they were they were limited to uh, to parlay betting uh, until the Supreme Court's decision uh, striking down the past for this past May. And Jerry might be able to comment on this, but I believe parlay betting is much more profitable than straight up betting on a game. It and is, and, and, and Delaware has still experienced a lot more parlay bets than straight bets right now. They've been, they've gone to straight um, because they, they they've their, their customers are so used to playing parlays, and um, and that's where really where the money is. Uh, the, you know, it's a, it's much more profitable if your customers all play parlays. Right. It's far more profitable from what I've seen. Straight bets are minimal profits, but the parlays can be anywhere from 17 to 30 percent, depending on whose model you use. Yeah. And that's a big difference than being in the single digits for a straight on wager. Um, yes? In Rhode Island, have you done any projections out on where you see the revenue streams by percent mobile versus? Based well, we're looking at Del uh, New Jersey, obviously, and mobile has done very well. I think they're doing 75 to 80 percent uh, bets are coming off mobile. Uh, so we hopefully we're going to experience a very similar. And very similar to New Hampshire, we have a lot of tourism in the state, 
the, the drawback we're going to have, or one of the provisions we put in, we recommend to be in the bill, that you had to actually go to the facilities, uh, two casinos, because and to register. Uh, we weren't going to just allow you to register on your phone from a remote location. Uh, you have to go into the casino. We want to see your ID. We want to see who you are. We want to make sure you're, you're, you, you have not been uh, excluded from the casinos in the past. Uh, and we want to make sure you, you are who you are and uh, track it that way. Uh, once you once you do that, once you establish your account, you can freely, you know, transfer money into your account. Though but we have not, uh, we, we're hoping to experience that kind of uh, revenue. We need to relieve. We have it's it's a we have such a, a, a overflow of people right now that it, it's very concerning. We had a, up to an hour and a half wait in line with 14. We call them tills. These are places where you, windows where you put the place of wager. F uh, an hour and a half wait during uh, the, the the two days prior to Super Bowl. Uh, hopefully, we, again, the kiosks are going in tomorrow. The, the biggest challenge we had, one of the biggest challenges we had, was the learning curve for both the teller, who didn't know how to take a wager, and the person making the wager, who didn't know how to do that either. So they were, <laughs> they were both. Uh, it was challenging on both ends. Uh, so we could, we could train the tellers, we could teach them, but until you get into live, uh, live taking bets, it was very, very challenging. And the same we're going to experience with kiosks tomorrow. We're putting in 17 kiosks into our biggest casino, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's not going to create problems. We're still going to have bottlenecks, and we anticipate, you know, such strong turnouts in the next three weeks. Okay. Are there any? Yes. Uh, in terms of HB 480 that it just passed, what's the sort of prognosis from here in terms of the legislative process and where it might go? Sure. So the next step is that it's going to be over in the House Senate. And with my conversation with the senators, it seems like it has strong support there as well. Uh, as you know, our, gov our governor came out in support of it and put it in his budget. Um, so uh, I would anticipate a pass. Um, I'm not sure where they may want to go to on amendments, but um, right now it sounds like it, it, will, it will pass through in some form. Mike? Just curious uh, if either Mark or, or any of the other panel members have explored uh, any avenues to try to mitigate the loss risk on the sports betting side, whether through uh, joint liquidity pools or anything of that nature. Uh, you know, obviously we have a unique situation here in New England where you have major sports teams who have a history of success and a very loyal sports base, so fan base, so they're always going to be betting on that particular team. It really creates a, a heavy dynamic occasionally against yeah, the house. Mike, it's a good question, uh, and, and we really wrestled with that before the Super Bowl because we were realizing 85% of the bets being placed were on the, were on the Patriots, so they're coming in. They're betting with their hearts, not with their minds. And I'll give you a quick story. We, so to answer your question, we did not do that. We wanted to keep the line as close as what was being offered in Vegas. We debated that question, should we move the line? We're at, uh, it was initially at 2.5, it stayed at 2.5 uh, in New Jersey and in Vegas, we were at three, hoping to give us ourselves a little edge. We considered moving higher, uh, uh, again, to protect ourselves a little more and hopefully move people to, to start to bet on the Rams. But we chose not to do that. We wanted to be very competitive, not only with the, with the, the, you know, the other states or the jurisdictions, and we're going to be very competitive with Mass and Connecticut comes online too. We have to be very similar. Uh, but we also were very concerned about what's happening on the street. You know, the, again, these long lines of people were probably placing bets illegally before. We want them to c continue to place them legally and not to go back to their bookie because uh, they have a better better line. A quick story in New Jersey, and I've told this several times, so if you've heard it, I, saw, I apologize. Uh, the line was two and a half points. I'm sorry. Uh, we, we were th uh, three. We were given three, and in New, in, in New Jersey was given two and a half. There was an individual male who was uh, very prosperous, and he, he did very well, and he wanted – he wanted those three points. So he drove up to, to Rhode Island from New Jersey, rather than place this wager in New Jersey, and took his backpack into the casino, placed $352,000 on the Rams, and lost, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> so there is, but when, when, when that takes place, you know, there is a mechanism that takes place. We just don't accept that wager. Mm -hmm. You know, the bells and whistles start going off, and there's calls made to Vegas and to our book, uh, our bookmakers, and, and it's very interesting. Come when you, when you when you go to Vegas and see the bookies, they're all in a room, and you know they're they're, they're taking all these calls, and they're all middle aged or older aged guys, you know, and uh, uh, scruffy looking individuals. But they're the they're the, the you know the the back room of the of the bookmaker uh, protecting us and, and evaluating whether they're going to take the wage. They knew this individual. 
uh, they knew who the individual was, and, and we have a process now of uh, allowing, uh, giving people identifiable numbers so they can tell us when they want to place a large wage, uh, and we can converse with, with Vegas, and they will give the, the green light or say, no, cut that down, you know, or raise, raise the line on that person if we don't, if we think it's too big a risk. Do you have limits in place of what a wager? Ten thousand dollars right now, and then you know we, we can, can we can fluctuate. That, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's sort of a trade-off. Uh, you know, how much flexibility do you want to give to your vendor consultant that's providing the uh, the odds, uh, and uh, what sort of uh, indemnification are you going to impose on them? So you, you I think you can contractually uh, protect yourself as a lottery. Uh, depending on uh, you know, how much flexibility you're will willing to give your uh, your odds maker, uh, because you uh, obviously you've engaged them because they're experts, and so if they're experts, you know, and and if they have a piece of the or if, you know, depending on what their compensation structure and all that is, you know, you might be able to um, work something out. The di one of the difficulties is that. Uh, the wire, one of the difficulties that the Wire Act causes is that you can't lay off bets. Uh, so in Nevada, this, it, it, you know, it doesn't happen all that often, but it does happen that uh, book, books can feel that they're out of balance and they lay off their bets with another uh, book. Uh, but when you have uh, in Massachusetts maybe two facilities, I don't know what, what I've, there's several possibilities uh, with the bills that I've seen, but uh, you know, it's just you have to keep the bets within the boundaries of the state, and that that reduces the flexibility that uh, that you have. And it even happened when I was a prosecutor, where I don't know if you remember the P Patriots and the Packers Super Bowl. Well, sadly, uh, yeah, sadly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the street line in Boston was 13 points against the Patriots. The Vegas line was 15 against the Patriots. And they scored it being 14. So every bookmaker in Massachusetts who had an account in Nevada and laid off of all their wagers to Nevada on the Patriots collected both from the better and Nevada. So essentially, they won every single bet that they placed. <laughs> and so when you, that's what's when Jerry talks about middling lines, and certainly the, the point or two points, that's the fear you, you, you end up in is worried about those type of situations. And it wouldn't have made a difference with the Patriots, obviously. No. But, I, but what it does, what it does for those now involved in sports betting, it takes the fun out of watching these games, because all you're doing is you're just thinking how much you're going to lose, or how much you're going to win. <laughs> uh, I wanted the Patriots to win by two points. That's all. <laughs> but they didn't. Missed that extra point. Question <laughs> for the representative: Did you say that during your process you weren't contacted by any of the leagues? I was not contacted by any of the leagues, and I don't believe any of them came to committee to do any kind of testimony. At all. It seems so, like the three lawyers who are represented here, represented here, that long-term relationships with all the teams, that they would a, support the lawyers and watch the lotteries to be a part of it. So it's kind of I don't know, Director Alvin, if that if they were involved in. Or not. I, do think, I'm sorry. I do think Charlie's point is probably the most accurate. Was that the fact that New Hampshire has no professional sports teams? So I'm not sure there was very much interest in having kind of a conversation with us. Yeah, they, they certainly, so, you know, we, yeah. we had discussions, the uh, NBA, mm -hmm. um, NFL. Certainly, but it never went very far in terms of wanting impact of the bill. And the like. Yeah, I mean, they came in early because we were early to, you know, in the game. Uh, so they made their presentations, the NFL and NBA, uh, uh, but uh, it, it didn't, didn't fly and didn't hold any water. So, but we I actually I have a conference call with the NFL this week, uh, again, just to reintroduce and start, to get the conversations going. Because there is concern. I mean, I mean you know, they were all concerned about their players and so forth and, the, you know, the employees and, this, as, as this starts to expand across the country. Yes? Are we going to ever see the regulation of fantasy sports and sports gambling come, meet and come together, or do they do all think they're going to remain separate? So we, we regulate fantasy sports now, and really it's related to the operator of the fantasy sports and making sure they're doing what they say they do to the customer. Um, it's a very different from the purposes of sports betting, only because fantasy sports tends to be a little bit lighter player tends to be more of a um, casual player versus sports betting can be like it's hard to manipulate a fantasy sports product because you have to so many outcomes mm. you're talking eight or seven or nine outcomes uh, versus a sports betting where you're talking one off uh, and that gets even scarier when you're talking one player versus one player 
you know, like a tennis match, for example. That's a scary situation because it can be so – we're only talking one person versus fantasy sports where it's lots of teams and lots of players in those teams. But, yeah, they, I mean, they, they certainly act the same way, and I think the DraftKings FanDuel folks, um, their um, databases are full of folks who are interested in sports betting. Provisions in your contract with these third-party providers to protect your cell phone number from sports telemarketing agencies? Uh, yes, there is. Yes, we, we will not allow that. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, I know minor league betting is hard to come by, but both Rhode Island and New Hampshire have prominent minor league baseball and hockey teams. Would you ever consider taking sports bets on that, or would it be similar to? How Major League Baseball asked the states not to take bets on spring training. You know, we were asked by uh, Major League Baseball not to take bets on spring training, uh, and we, along with Vegas and Delaware, said no, thank you. We have very, very little wages put on on, on spring training, and there are controls in place. Um, I, I'm not sure the concerns of Major League Baseball, other than maybe, again, they want to have a voice. Um, what we have not restricted from minor league uh, baseball right now, we, we will be allowed to bet on minor league. Uh, the only thing is uh, you cannot bet on in-state colleges. Any other questions? Um, in closing, one of the things I like to say is it's a very hot topic across the country. Spectrum Game is actually involved in several studies. Um, they're also out to bid for several studies. Most states who don't have it are taking a look into it, eye gaming as well as sports betting. I believe North Carolina and Virginia are going out to bid. I know I'm finishing up with uh, Spectrum, a study in Louisiana, taking a look at all, all aspects of it. Um, and there were actually seven points in Louisiana to the bid, uh, looking at everything from lottery to sports betting to placement of casinos. So it's another place where the states needing a lot of revenue are looking to sports gaming. And it needs to be done right because of the integrity and because of people's lives are at risk and because of problem gambling. So there are a lot of studies going on. It's a very hot topic. I expect it to continue depending on the court case. That could change everything, obviously. This could all be for moot, but I doubt that. <laughs> I have a lot of faith in Charlie, and it is uh, a lot of I know where Deborah and I are going to be. April, yeah. April 11th. Yes. <laughs> <So, laughs> I think I might see. I'm not sure what else is teach, but. Yeah, but that's really important. Um, and, Mark, do you have any thing to add? Does anybody else have anything to add? Well, I, I just would say, as yeah. you said, that the, uh, the action will be in New Hampshire uh, on April 11th. Uh, certainly uh, the, that uh, that suit, I think, uh, uh, New Hampshire has uh, established itself. Not, not only was it the first lottery, but it was the first to sue in, uh, in respect of that uh, decision. I think uh, uh, it will be very, very interesting, uh, and uh, a lot of eyes will be on New Hampshire to see how that turns out. A lot of states took a look at it, thought about filing suit, uh, but they deferred to Charlie and his experience. And, and this is a compliment to Charlie. I very rarely give it to him, but they respect him a lot. <laughs> very rarely. <laughs> very rarely. And they all held off. What was my nickname? Yeah, I, I <laughs> not going to say it in public. Well, obviously, the sales prevention team. Uh, yeah, sales <laughs> prevention team when I was at the yeah. Mass Lottery. With them. But <laughs> they have a lot of respect for Charlie and the industry, and they did not file suit. They did the amicus brief, and they're letting Charlie lead the way, which says a lot about your director in New Hampshire. I just want to let people know that. And as I say, the other gentleman, um, Representative Lang, putting that bill forward, that's a huge step forward. It's sometimes putting a sports betting or putting any type of gambling bill forward is not the most popular thing to do. So it takes a lot of courage, understanding to do the right thing. And Jerry's done a great job over the years, you know, 23 years, he said it was. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that says a lot about him. And Mark, I've worked with, he's on, about to become on the board of Mass Council on Problem Gambling. Um, so he's on both aspects. He appreciates the right for people to wager, but to re wager responsibly and for a safety net to be there if there is an issue. Um, we're going to finish right on time, I believe. One minute. Is that okay, Dan? Right. Dan, thank you for inviting us all. I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as um, Michael introduced me, my name is Justin Stempick. I'm an associate general counsel with the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. Uh, we have a great panel here today to discuss uh, the state of play in Massachusetts. Uh, on our panel today, we have uh, Executive Director Michael Sweeney from the Mass state, Massachusetts State Lottery. We have Senator Brennan Crichton. Uh, we have Representative Dan Coulinane and Commissioner Gail Cameron from the Massachusetts Gaming Commission.
So hopefully we'll get a, a wide view of what's going on with sports betting in Massachusetts. So without further ado, I'll uh, set it off. And just for the panelists here, I have a couple questions that obviously are targeted more at the legislators on the panel than others. But the rest of the questions, uh, if you have an opinion or want to talk about it, feel free to jump in. I'm not going to target too many questions directly at too many of you. So feel free to take, think of it more as a, a conversation starter rather than a question answer, question answer with me. Um, that being said, I'll go against what I just said and ask two questions to the two legislators on the panel. Um, Senator Crichton and Representative Kulinane, you both introduced legislation to le recently to legislate sports betting in Massachusetts. Uh, what led you to that decision and why is now the right time for Massachusetts to get into sports betting? Why don't we start with... I'll defer to the Senate. I was going to defer to the Senate. <laughs> no, we please. work very well together in Massachusetts. Uh, so I, I had taken up the issue of daily fantasy sports last session and Right as we were kind of debating that, whether or not it should go under the Gaming Commission and how it should be regulated, the decision came down and really seemed like a good opportunity. Obviously, Massachusetts is no stranger to gambling. Uh, we've had horse racing forever. The lottery has obviously been very successful. Casinos recently and daily fantasy sports. So it seemed like it would be a great opportunity to pull folks out of the shadows, get some additional revenue, and uh, provide the, the safeguards that we want to have for our consumers. Representative Kulin? Sure. Um, I mean, I would just say quite candidly, regulating it is better than ignoring it and, and, and hoping that people forget that it exists. Uh, I think there was a quote in State House News where Jamie Chisholm from DraftKings was like, it's, it's here. It's just not, it's just not uh, legal. And so uh, when, we have that, when we have that conversation, it comes down to revenue. And there's opportunities with revenue there uh, to kind of bring this out of the shadows, to have that conversation to allow people to be better protected, to regulate what's already there. Um, you know, and, and at the end of the day, uh, that's, what, that's what it comes down to. It's all better than ignoring it. Can I just add one more thing, Justin? Sure. So I think also just in Massachusetts, uh, I mean, we're 50% partner with our uh, casinos. So we certainly want to make sure that they have the most attractive product possible. And, you know, in our, our legislation, we provide uh, brick and mortar the opportunity to uh, pursue sports betting. So we want them to be successful the revenue we're expecting to come from them certainly depends on it. And uh, I'll, I'll note that there have been a number of other bills that have also been introduced by other legislators, both in the Senate and in the House. So just looking at the specific legislation that the two of you have introduced, what do you think sets your particular legislation apart from the other legislation that's kind of in the mix and I think has recently, most of it's been pulled into a subcommittee, but why don't you just talk about your particular legislation and let us know what, what, what sets it apart from the, the crowd, I guess. So, I mean, there are a few bills are, are pretty similar. The governor's filed a piece. Uh, I guess a, the real uh, big difference between my bill and his would be that he excludes all uh, college sports. We felt like there's such a strong market with college sports that we really wouldn't be able to pull folks out of the black market and get them to participate if we completely eliminated that. That being said, we did, uh, you know, prohibit betting on uh, colleges within our state like some other states uh, have done. I think the biggest question that we had going into this was the online component. I think, you know, you see from state to state that that's been answered. Um, it's really going to be the future of sports betting, and we feel like if we're going to be competitive, that needs to be a part of it. Right. Representative? Sure. And a as we get our arms around this, I, I just want to say it it's great that we uh, we're taking our time with this. Um, I, I think it's, uh, you know, once this ruling happened, it became a race. Um, and it, th that race can be a sprint or it can be a race to get it right. You know, one's very quick, one takes a little bit more of a process. And so, uh, I want to give credit to our chair of economic development, Ann Margaret Ferrante, our new chair of Ways and Means, Aaron Mikowitz, and Speaker DeLeo, for really being very deliberate about the, the 11 bills that exist in economic development right now. Um, and, and, you know, I, I couldn't agree more with what Brendan said about, uh, I mean, just look at the March Madness numbers alone, what people are expected to, to bet. And, and if you do not if, allow for collegiate betting, then at the end of the day, uh, folks are going to stay on those uh, illegal platforms. And so I think from what differs from my bill from the, the other or so bills that, that have been introduced is, is that mine uh, pays, uh, gets into the official league data, um, which separates it because, you know, I think in order to bring this all out of the shadows and out of the black market, uh, you need to be attracting users. And, and with the official league data, in my, in, in my opinion, I mean, you get the speed, reliability, accuracy, ownership, and ultimate accountability because at the end of the day, it is the product that these leagues put forward that is being bet on. And so 
I think they hold the bag at the end of the day anyway to either rightfully or wrongfully be blamed. And so I believe that they should be at the center of it um, in order to keep investing in the integrity of that data. Because once we get past the newness of this all, it's going to be about the integrity of the data and what separates it from working versus third party vendors that may not be as accurate, that might have that lag time, that can create those errors. Justin, if I can just sure. jump in. Yeah. So I'm Gail Cameron and uh, with the Massachusetts Gaming Commission, but I did spend, um, I'm really happy to hear this conversation about integrity. I spent many years in New Jersey, uh, although I'm from Massachusetts, I spent many years in New Jersey uh, with the New Jersey State Police, uh, many years early in my career working organized crime cases. I feel like I have to make a disclosure at this point <laughs> because uh, Director <laughs> asked, to raise your hand if you've ever bet on sports betting. I bet my, my hand went right up. I said, everybody's looking at me like, wow, it's not legal. But I worked a number of undercover jobs in New Jersey around organized crime, around sports betting, one in particular where it was a very violent org, uh, group uh, with loan sharking and, and the methods. So we really, it rose to the level where we, we made a major case out of this with sports betting and loan sharking. And me as the undercover, right, in the 80s, early 90s, it really was a, a situation where they just didn't think of a woman in that capacity. So I, I think I had some success. And um, my, my technique, though, I had about an hour drive to get to this particular bar, and I went in about three or four times a week. And um, Mike and the Mad Dog, are we familiar with, you know, my, I listened on the way up, you know, New York radio, and they would go on Fridays, they'd always give their picks, and they're, you know, who's going to win games? So I actually you know, uh, right, the anomaly, a woman betting all the time on sports betting in this bar. And, um, you know, I did pretty well because I was listening to their picks. Of course, all the money went right to the state police. But um, I raised my hand and I said, God, people are probably looking at me like, why did I bet on sports betting? But I did. And so I'm really interested in the integrity piece because of what I've seen in my career. And I'm happy to hear both of our legislators here talk about the main reason is, you know, bring it out of the shadows. I'm not going to opine on whether or not I think it should be legal because that's up to the legislature. But certainly the integrity piece is important to me. And um, it's nice that it's being highlighted here today. And on the, on the piece, just jumping back to what the representative said about official league data, obviously this has been a point of discussion and contention in some states. And you see Nevada pushing back pretty strongly saying, hey, we never had it mandated here. Why should it be mandated now? So I guess looking at it holistically, are there any, are there any detriments to requiring the use of league data? I, I know there's a lot of positives, which, which we can talk about, but are there any detriments? Does it create a monopoly, for example, for whoever MLB decides to give the data to? I mean, there should be there, are there any concerns, I guess, about mandating the use of official league data? Sure, I mean, I, I'll, I'll just say that, that I mean, the answer to that is obvious. There have been cases that have been brought up, but I, I think that goes to kind of down the road, again, past the, the newness wearing off of this, is that you know the question of that data is going to be fundamental. And, and, and I think in order to really focus on, again, getting this right and having the data be official, no matter what happens at the end of the day, no matter what third party, it's always the official league data that's going to go back to. Now, the third party vendors might have to end up cleaning it up and owning, owning the mistakes, but at the end of the day, the official data is always going to be turned to. And I think it's very easy oftentimes in this conversation to say uh, that all of these leagues, the multi-billionaires, we don't need to give them more money and, and we can just do it without it. And, and, and it kind of ends there because it, it's tough to get a sympathetic ear. But I, th I think from where I'm standing point, there, there is a fundamental concept of ownership. It is their product. It is being bet on. And if it's going to be turned to at the end of the day, then what, what we really need to look at is making sure that they, as a league, don't dial it back, but really ratchet it up and continue to invest in making sure that the integrity of their data, which is, which is official, rightly or wrongly, is, is the 100% accurate. Because as you read continual stories about you know, third-party data and offshore data and what happens when the, when the lag time is too long and, you know, and things like that that result in big-time mistakes, um, I, I think you know, as we begin the process, we really need to look 10 steps ahead. And, and, and I would rather get this right on the front end by turning to the official data than to not and let it be tied up in the courts way down the road. Now, now at this point, we've seen sports betting legalized in, I think, eight different states. And you've heard just in the earlier panel about 
uh, Rhode Island's efforts as well as New Hampshire's efforts. So what can Massachusetts do that can build upon what we've seen other states do to make, if and when sports betting becomes legal in Massachusetts, what can we do to take lessons learned from other states and improve upon them in Massachusetts? And I'll put this out to everybody. You know, I, I'll just jump in really quick. I think uh, both the representative and senator hit upon key points, which is I think Massachusetts made a great decision to take a deep breath and sort of analyze what was going on in other states and what type of bills were being enacted and also what the actual on-the-ground impact uh, was as they began to accept uh, that betting. Uh, but I also just wanted to point out really quick, I also think Massachusetts is in a very unique position in comparison to some of those other states uh, because we're a state that does not have sports betting as of yet and we do all, also do not, not legally. have not, not okay. legally. And we also do not have legally online betting for lotteries. And I, you know, to me, it's an opportunity to perhaps to examine both issues and to get the right, uh, right language, uh, integrity, transparency, and responsible gambling aspects right uh, across a very significant platform uh, in work in cooperation with the Gaming Commission, the lottery, and the state legislature uh, to really perhaps iron out the wrinkles better than any other state has to date uh, in the country. I, oh, no, go ahead. No, you're next. I just want to say I, I agree with Michael, and um, you know, certainly we considered uh, taking a closer look at having the lottery be a part of our bill, but we think pursuing the track to providing iLottery as well as cashless lottery, give them um, those assets and, and really help them grow that way. Um, obviously, we depend greatly on the revenue that comes from the lottery. We don't want sports betting at all to make a dent into that. So I certainly think you'll see some energy from the legislature to pursue both of these at the same time. Yeah, if I could just add to that, again, uh, up to the legislature as to who um, operates, but certainly uh, regulates, rather. Uh, but we have been doing our homework. We are, have been preparing in case it comes to the, the Gaming Commission. We want to be. So lots of lessons learned from other jurisdictions. Um, we have been dialoguing with New Jersey folks, with Nevada folks. Um, really trying to uh, understand what's happening. And uh, a lot of the things I'm hearing are very interesting. Again, I'm a little bit focused on the integrity piece because that's really uh, important to me. Uh, but responsible gaming, of course, and we share this. We, you know, we, uh, Michael and I have uh, done, done things together for responsible gaming and we talk about having the best interest of the Commonwealth and not, not competing, but what's, what's best for the Commonwealth. But, but lots of things that uh, we've been learning. Um, you know, certainly regulating this is, is very similar to what we do now. Strong investigations, strong licensing process, you know, making sure uh, operators, um, we, we, we regulate now in a manner that I think is, is pretty um, robust. And I think that's, that's a good thing. Anything we do here in the Commonwealth, I think, um, you know, the public, um, the public wants to know that it's clean. The public wants to know what, I think people would prefer to do this legally rather than illegally. I really believe that. I hear people talking about driving to Rhode Island to bet because they'd really rather do it legally. So um, all of those things I think are important, you know, the, the way we make sure we have clean people. The other thing I like about what we do here is we have very strong relate because I, again I had this experience in New Jersey very strong relationship with state local and federal partners as far as sharing information critical with sports betting some of the uh, monitoring systems um, SWIMA which is uh, New Jersey has mandated that you use a monitoring system which I think is um, really interesting. And it is really uh, a fusion center, a law enforcement type fusion center where the data is shared and an analysis is made whether or not there's an anomaly and is it, is it suspicious? Is it, you know, what, what level is it, you know, do we just want to, it's more than one alert. So sharing that data I think is huge to the integrity piece and um, what they're doing I think it's something for all of us to learn from and decide whether or not that's appropriate. Um, to use a monitoring system like that. And I think that's a shared responsibility, right? The leagues have a responsibility. They have integrity programs. The regulators certainly have responsibilities, as do the operators. And I think with, with that shared responsibility, there really is a way to keep this, um, keep it clean and regulate it the right way. And, and I, would, I would just add, <coughs> kind of in closing, I, I think the, the most comforting part of all of this is, you know, Brendan's offered a bill, I've offered a bill, you know, 
nine other folks have offered bills on this, and, and it, as you go through and read all, all of these bills, there are way more similarities than, than differences. You know, there's, there's always going to be a difference on what the initial sign-up mm -hmm. fee is or on what the annual renewal fee is going to be. But, but when you got into protection of vulnerable populations, when you got into having conversations around problem gaming and, and wanting to be out front on that, and, and when you see all of those things, the protections and integrity pieces in place across all of the bills, I think then we're starting from a very healthy standpoint because that enables uh, those in the room in, in economic development and ways and means that are having these conversations with the governor, not only in our state, but, but throughout the country. Because I think as we, we look towards the future, you know, there is going to be a federal bill put forward on legalizing federal uh, sports gaming nationally. And so uh, I think with all of the states doing different things, I think there's an inherent ability to cooperate. And, and I think that's what really pushes this forward as opposed to kind of minor technical differences. And just sort of dovetailing off of that statement, um, obviously the online discussion is perhaps the most robust discussion surrounding sports betting now. You, you see the numbers out of New Jersey, you see Rhode Island going for the push for online now, New, New Hampshire just doing it. What, what, is, what are the, those main points circling around in Massachusetts with respect to the discussion of online sports betting? What are the, what are the concerns? What are the benefits? What, where do, how, does, how is Massachusetts viewing that from a legislative perspective? And then I guess more holistically, you know, what do we, what do you see as uh, the, the net, yeah, the net benefits and the net, net detriments to an online operation of sports betting? I, th I think a lot of people um, may not know this, but we already have uh, online betting through our, you know, horse racing in Massachusetts. So it's not as popular as, you know, sports across the board, but uh, it's a system that's in place. And what we've seen from Daily Fantasy or from other uh, sports betting online and mobile platforms across the country as they're starting to pop up now is the ability to track that data to uh, identify irregularities in betting and to actually you know increase consumer protection i think there will be a counter argument to that saying that it's going to you know promote problem gaming in that you know everyone at least from our generation is you know looking at their phone nonstop and and with that mobile device are you going to enable folks more but i think you'll be able to identify those problems and again we're not going to pull anybody i'm not going to pull the amount of people we need to out of the black market to make it successful without online. Well, I, I, um, I certainly agree with that. And from what we're studying, we're really um, engaged in the in the responsible gaming piece with the Gaming Commission. And um, you know, we have a director of responsible gaming, and he has been researching all of these things. And we've talked about the fact that you really can track information if somebody's betting more frequently. Uh, all of a sudden betting many more dollars than they were, is that a red flag? And there are ways to identify that and, and address it. So um, I think your point is very well taken that that is easier to track than someone that goes to a casino. So that is one, one aspect that, um, that, that, is, that is easier when it comes to responsible gaming. Yeah, so I agree. I think the technology does have the ability to protect more than it has. Uh, than some of the kind of the, the arguments that spur fear. I think it really can protect individuals and can be used for good. Um, and, and, and then the question of online gaming, and, and I can only speak for, for my bill, but it's the question of tying it to specific casino locations while allowing mobile, while allowing online. Should they be affiliated with a particular brick and mortar? And, and that's, uh, my bill sa says yes, because uh, I believe we're, we're spending a lot of uh, time and energy and revenue to try to build up these destination resort casinos. And, and I think that if you can tie them while allowing online to, to, to exist, but it's still f having that relationship, I think, is incredibly important. And that can be with existing entities, and it doesn't have to be exclusive. They can work with more than one. But I think just having a tie into um, the casinos that, that uh, one is, uh, I believe, just opened and the next one's on, on, on the cusp of opening. And so... Um, I think that's an important relationship to establish, and granted, that's all going to get flushed out, but I, I think that's an important piece of the conversation to your question. Similar to the New Jersey model, where it is bricks and mortars, racetracks, casinos, mm -hmm. and they allow up to four sports books per, right. uh, per facility. You know, Ch New Hampshire's lottery director, Charlie McIntyre, you know, had a great comment during the last panel that um, retail behavior does not know ge geography. And in the past, what people were looking for, say, from 1970 through 1990, 2000, was convenience. 
and technology has completely changed the definition, in my opinion, of what convenience means now. Convenience used to mean that you had the ability to leave your house, get in your car, maybe drive five to 10 miles to a physical location, and the convenience was that that location was open 24 seven, seven days a week. And an entire new business model developed around that convenience, whether it was literally a store 24, or a CVS that would be open with their pharmacy at certain locations 24 seven. But you had to go, the customer had to physically go somewhere. Today I would tell you that convenience means technology. The customer wants to be able to access what they want to be able to access 24 seven from whatever location it is that they choose to engage that product. And I think the experience of New Jersey and other states have shown uh, the power of, of being able to place a bet uh, through a mobile application. And I, I don't think that any state is going to be able to uh, truly address illegal sports gambling uh, without that mobile piece in it. And I certainly agree with all my colleagues. Uh, anyone who has a concern about uh, irresponsible betting behavior, uh, then you want as much technology involved because the data analytics you get about individual and group behaviors, as well as the ability of a governmental actor to be able to control that behavior, uh, increases exponentially uh, with the technology elements and the mobile elements as opposed to just uh, a retail setting. And I think that applies across the board uh, to whatever the gambling pathway is, whether it's uh, casino gaming, sports betting, lottery products, or, or horse racing product. Yeah, and I, probably for most of the audience here, you don't need to be to reminded of this, but the legal market is extremely sophisticated. So any obviously, we have to be cognizant when we're having these discussions about the fact that any legal product or legalization of this product has to be aware that people are betting online illegally now, and they're not going into the back shop of a smoky bar to write on a slip of paper anymore. That's not how it goes. So it's a much more sophisticated environment. So a legal product has to compete with that and be at least as sophisticated, you would think. So... I think that's suggested by both of the, the two representatives here, the, the bills. Um, Representative, you, you mentioned that you, you're tying of the, the New Jersey model, tying of the, the online operation to the brick and mortar. Now, Senator Crichton, does your bill do the same thing, or do you take a different tact on no, that? No, we, we opted not to, to tether, and I'm not you know, here to debate whether that's the best uh, <laughs> approach or not. We we'll certainly let the committee process play out. Uh, but we just felt like, I mean, in Massachusetts, we're home to DraftKings. We're home to you know technology hub really to give the most freedom possible to the online and mobile applications. Also recognizing that they have the bandwidth and the ability to really do this on their own. Uh, we certainly want to see the success of our casinos. Like I mentioned earlier, we're a partner with them. Uh, but uh, to that same end, we feel like this industry could grow here and um, there's no need to tether at this point. But certainly uh, look forward to the continued debate. I should also mention, I keep talking about brick and mortar, but we did include also uh, the existing licensees for racing as well in the state right and that that's been an interesting discussion where you know in new jersey we first saw it obviously they're sort of first first out there with the racetracks uh getting sports betting so massachusetts has active standard bread and currently thoroughbred racing as well as some other uh, interested parties and in potentially opening up expanded thoroughbred racing in the future and that's going to be an active part of the discussion with respect to whether the horse uh the horse racing industry gets involved in sports betting so i, I know that's part of senator Crichton's bill um, was that a consideration at all with you, Representative? Um, it, I mean, it was. I mean, everything's kind of on the table. I think as, as we look at, you know, what's in each individual bill, it, there's an acknowledgement that as we take our time and with so many different bills offered, that kind of each individual bill had, had a piece that they wanted to discuss in the whole conversation. Um, and so while mine was more on the, the piece on the data, uh, versus, uh, the, say, the horse racing or, or other things. Um, I think it speaks to what what the you know the chair of economic development and ways and means and the speaker and, and senate president are, are dealing with because as we you know kind of applaud the the decision to kind of take a deep breath and figure this out, you know they're watching what's happening with other states, right? And, and it, it we don't have a finite amount of data right now on which to base the decision. It's as our internal process plays out, we're seeing different revenue projections from other states. We're seeing different information on uh, what was thought to be working, which may not be working, and what is actually working better. And so 
with all of those pieces, I, I think it's a very fluid conversation right now uh, as everyone's kind of doing their, their due diligence on the process. And I, and I think that's a, a real testament to kind of what they're doing in their, in their decision to really try to focus on getting it right. I think Massachusetts also has the added benefit of, of having experience in the betting world setting previously. Like I think the Massachusetts State Legislature, whether you're talking about the Senate President uh, or the House Speaker and a lot of your members, you know, I would argue they really did get uh, casinos and that world of gambling 100% right. Uh, the legislation that they passed, I think, was some of the most foresightful legislation that was passed in the country, uh, creating a gaming commission, mm -hmm. doing such innovative things as estab establishing a, a public health trust fund mm -hmm. uh, to specifically address uh, the issues of problem gambling and other things that can happen around a casino environment um, and also making provisions within that bill uh, within that legislation uh, to protect the existing Massachusetts State Lottery at that time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so I really feel Massachusetts because of the legislative leadership it really is acting from a position of strength in this particular world that a lot of states did not have that type of benefit mm -hmm. uh, because they didn't have exposure other than lotteries uh, into the gaming world I think that's going to serve us well in the long term. And, and, and if I may, I just want to also really give credit to Speaker DeLeo at that time. Uh, as this was all being flushed out, the legislature just didn't kind of cross its fingers and hope we got it right. He, he, he put forward and, and made sure that he brought in industry experts like Spectrum to do a top-to-bottom analysis over the proposed legislation to, to make sure, not just from a, a legislative intent perspective that we got it right, but that actually from an industry point that we were making sure that we were hitting our stride the right way and so I think he deserves tremendous credit for that as and 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 we have no doubt that that, that due diligence is going to continue with this as well absolutely yeah I, I would concur um, you know really being involved with this industry now and you know from being in New Jersey for many years and now back home in Massachusetts um, really is strong legislation and you know when it comes to responsible gaming, the monies to do that well, the research involved, and the um, the monies that go to, say, the Attorney General's office and our office with um, to fight the illegal market. I mean, there's some significant cases have been made in the last couple of years around um, illegal gaming in the Commonwealth, and frankly, law enforcement does not, for the most part, have the resources to handle those issues. It it has you know, violent crime is really the priority. But when there are monies dedicated, monies meaning monies for bodies to investigate as well as making cases, um, that really helps. That really helps. So the idea, you know, your office, Absolutely. all of our offices have been involved because we share information. Yeah. Um, you know, lottery brings information and in that says, hey, there are illegal slot machines in these locations. So. Um, that is that is something that's uh, noteworthy, and other states, other parts of the country, really do take note of what we're able to do here because uh, the legislation called for all of these things to happen and, and gave the resources to do it. Yeah, I just I, I want to emphasize that that last point because I, I hope that as Massachusetts engages this dialogue, uh, that the requirements that Commissioner Cameron just mentioned. Uh, are mirrored in new gaming bills. And so having the funding for uh, responsible uh, gambling and gaming and helping people out that are in a bad situation, uh, but also yeah. that law enforcement aspect uh, is, is really critical. So whether we're talking about daily fantasy sports or sports mm -hmm. betting in general, uh, placing those same type of criteria to make uh, forced contributions, if you will, uh, into a pool that can be utilized by the Gaming Commission, the Lottery, the AG's office, state police, mm -hmm. uh, really makes a huge difference. And, and not to get sidetracked just quick, but just to show you the level of, comp uh, of cooperation, uh, the Attorney General's office, um, the state police, uh, the office of State Treasurer Goldberg, and the Lottery teaming up with the Gaming Commission uh, really helped to bust uh, what was one of the more significant uh, illegal slot gaming mm -hmm. Uh, operations in New England and in doing that investigation it actually led to the solving uh, of a cold murder case out of Pennsylvania uh, that was over a decade old uh, where a police chief in Pennsylvania had been killed uh, and the individual involved in that uh, essentially had been uh, out on the run for uh, for an extensive period of time even after being on the FBI most wanted list 
uh, through this in joint investigation, yes. we were able to determine uh, that the individual had uh, deceased. And, uh, you know, that was a great deal of comfort both to uh, law enforcement but also to the family of that uh, state police officer, um, state uh, chief in Pennsylvania. And things like that don't happen um, and only happen when a state legislature uh, has the foresight that Massachusetts had to fund these type of cooperative efforts mm -hmm. uh, that at the end of the day really can make a meaningful impact. Right. And this murderer, it's his family that was running the illegal gambling exactly. operation, multiple towns, a couple of hundred illegal slot machines, yep. and the body was buried in the yard of the family. Right. So that was, um, it was good to solve that case. Absolutely. Now, each of you, have, I think, has touched in some way, shape, or form on the, the one of the biggest issues uh, in the sports betting conversation was integrity. So to the two lawmakers in the room, how do your bills address integrity specifically? And then I guess to the commissioner, what, what have you learned from other jurisdictions as far as best practices when it comes to integrity? I know you've touched on a few of those, but let's see if we can put a, put a big bow on this. What are, what are some best practices for integrity? So I mean, we, we uh, leaned a lot on Chapter 23K, the, the gaming legislation, just recognizing again that I think the best place for this to be regulated is under the Gaming Commission, uh, certainly, uh, you know, all the integrity pieces that were mentioned earlier will be a part of uh, our legislation. I think also just to talk about how robust our public health trust fund is, it's one of the largest funds in the nation, and certainly that's a, going to be important as we continue this debate moving forward to make sure that the resources are there, uh, both for the problem gaming end, but also that we have the due diligence of the commission to enforce those integrity pieces. Uh, not to not to belabor the point. It's just you know as you read all of these bills, these were the strongest and most similar sections throughout. Um, I think we each bill puts forward a state law enforcement agency that's going to be monitoring this. Each of the bills talks about using technology to protect vulnerable populations, uh, whether that's folks that can be preyed upon to, to to bet more or or folks that that are betting and, and betting in amounts that that, that they shouldn't. Uh, technology can really be uh, our friend in, in policing this, and I think that's where. From the governor's bill all the way through each of the bills proposed through the legislature that's where we saw the strongest language to really protect vulnerable people and to make sure that we use technology to do so yeah and i would concur and again i mentioned briefly earlier this um you know swimmer which is which is a um, uh, sports wagering monitoring integrity association um, and it is really getting mous with all the operators now other states use it New Jersey mandates that it be used. So all the, all the operators um, have to sign on that they will report uh, immediately any, and there's a whole platform in which to do this, right? Um, any unusual betting patterns or an individual, whatever it may be. And so that's, you know, kind of a, um, an alert that goes in and then they will monitor, this group will monitor and does it rise to the level of a suspicion? And then all of the regulars are not notified. Uh, regulators will have, um, with all of the bills, the staff to follow up with an investigation. It also gives um, give the ability, you know, that the technology is amazing. If there is something happening with an athlete, with an official, um, that is much more readily detected in an investigation to, um, to make sure this is clean. The leagues are, um, have to be a partner, obviously. Um, regulators and operators need to be active partners in sharing this information. And then, of course, law enforcement agencies having the resources to follow up and um, conduct these investigations to, to make sure it is, uh, it is clean. The integrity is really an important piece. You know, the great thing I think you're, you're hearing today, and I think it's been demonstrated in the past, is you're not hearing about turf wars in the Commonwealth, right? So whether it's from the governor's office or mm -hmm. Treasurer Goldberg's office or the Attorney General's office, our state elected leaders, the Gaming mm -hmm. Commission, the lottery, you know, this is an issue that we're all on the same page on. Uh, we don't have artificial walls built up between us. There's cooperation, there's communication. Mm -hmm. And again, our, our state elected officials uh, have been on the forefront of that and they're responsive to it. And I think that's what helps to really create uh, the type of winning cooperation that we've seen over the last couple of years in some of the cases that have been able to come forth out of Massachusetts on these issues. And so I think any type of breach of integrity or uh, potential of outside actors trying to uh, engage in, the, in any type of illegality as 
the gaming world in Massachusetts potentially is expanded, uh, they're going to have a significant wall uh, yeah. to try to breach. Right. So obviously, there's been discussion about how the leagues have to be involved in any any legalization efforts uh, for sports betting, but there has been some friction in that discussion as far as what was, was raised in the earlier discussion about uh, royalty fees or the integrity fee, as well as the recent uh, request by the leagues that, they, that some of the sports betting uh, legal jurisdictions not take bets on spring training. Mm -hmm. So is there, a, is there a, an approach that Massachusetts is leaning to when it comes to how much power to give the leagues with respect to what they can control when it comes to sports betting in Massachusetts? Um, any thoughts on that, that discussion to any of the, I guess, either lawmakers here? Sure. I mean, I would say it's, it's an evolving process, and I can only speak to my bill, and my bill, uh, what, what it allows for is a royalty of one quarter or 1% of the amounts wagered per calendar quarter from, from the commission to the sports wagering operator. Um, because I, I, again, go back to, you know, whether it's today, tomorrow, or in the future, the, the, the sports leagues are, are where the rubber meets the road. It's their product. Um, that's where the ultimate accountability lies. And, and I think as the objective with sports betting is really to be better than the black market. And so how can we be better than the black market aside just from the technology? It's that speed, reliability, and accuracy and that continued investment by the leagues into the latest and greatest technology to make sure that things are getting out uh, almost instantaneous in real time to make sure that the consumer, because of that, is having the best, most accurate, most reliable experience. And I think by doing that and by, by allowing them to put this money back into uh, their own process, which is going to be turned to anyway, it really does uh, uh, allow um, for that investment to make the overall experience for the consumer to, to, to be the best that it can be. And that's where I think, you know, uh, maybe not say it tomorrow, but in the future, that's what really is going to be needed um, is that integrity of the data in real time so that it doesn't become just the cheap alternative to use third-party data and, you know, when mistakes get made, you know, there's always that question of who owns it and, and what the reliable statistics are, and it's always going to come back to leak data, so we need them as part of it. So we, we kept uh, royalty or integrity fees uh, out of our legislation. It, it's something I would like to see play out through the committee process. I am the vice chair of the Economic Development Committee. I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves without having a more robust debate. I would just caution that with the margins being so small in sports betting that, you know, with our tax rate, uh, we said ours at 12.5 percent, which we believe is reasonable. But as you add on additional, you know, money set aside, it, it starts to become, uh, you know, the likelihood of being successful uh, decreases. So we have to be cautious of that. So obviously, just to touch on ta taxes, Senator uh, uh, Representative. Did you did you address do you address a, a particular tax rate in your bill, or is it uh, is that still up? No, for that the was debate? part kind of more more open as we look ahead yeah. to the, the the future of the debate through the committee process. And I and I think you know again as we not to be too repetitive, but as we kind of take into consideration what's working or what's not working to to make it the best possible with other states, um, I, I think that is. Uh, really best left kind of for that final bill that com comes out of economic development, which is going to be a combination of everything. And, and especially as we short term, you know, discuss budget uh, implications, you know, the governor uh, anticipated 35 million as, as revenue for this year, uh, if, if we were to go forward and legalize it. Um, but, but I guess all of those budget conversations are going to be sensitive to, to what's happening and what's working elsewhere. So we, we uh, with our 12.5 percent based off of you know, some work that the uh, Gaming Commission did as well as an Oxford study, uh, you know, we estimate between 50 and 60 million dollars based on our more open uh, method of pursuing that. So I think the governor's estimate, I, I assume that the difference there is, is largely the NCAA being left out of it, but uh, we'll have to dive into those numbers. Well, the studies are interesting, though. Um, the Oxford study you mentioned um, really does uh, talk about two things when it comes to a tax rate. It is um, a way to keep the illegal market out because you have to be competitive with the illegal market, right? And I think, um, you know, people know, people are wise that, that sport, they know when the odds are good or bad and they, they will go elsewhere <coughs> if, if 
uh, the tax rate is too high. So kind of twofold when it comes to tax rates. So, but uh, the legislators here are aware and paying attention. So. Um, We'll figure it out. Yes, yeah. they'll figure it out. And, and for anybody curious, the, the Oxford study was an Oxford economics report that was uh, put out by the AGA, partnered with them, I think it was two years ago. It's, it's a, if you Google it, you can find it. It's a, it, they did a state-by-state -state analysis of projected revenues for legalized sports betting in a couple of different rollout methods, uh, including Massachusetts. So it's one of the few sources out there for a state-by-state -state data breakdown of what a possible legalized sports betting regime would look like in Massachusetts, as well as any of any other state. It's based on population and some other economic metrics and that are too sophisticated for me to understand. And how did they, uh, how did Massachusetts rank in that study? We're, I, we're, we, we were, I think, compared to the UK as far as our fervent uh, fandom in Massachusetts. <laughs> so that was an easy uh, uh, parallel that the UK people were able to make because uh, we, we love sports in Massachusetts. So um, I, I just think, I think too, though, that that study and what uh, both our elected officials just brought up is very important to keep in mind here. Um, there's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of activity, there's a lot of business opportunity around this issue, uh, but we're not talking about within it, within an individual state um, a new pathway that's going to bring in, uh, for example, a billion dollars right. of profit, yeah. right? right? So the margins are small, uh, the initial uplift, while significant, uh, mm -hmm. is not as significant as some of the other revenue generators. Mm -hmm. but, but I also think one of the things that we haven't discussed a lot um, is the other potential benefits by channeling this money from an illegal stream into a legal stream. It's something mm -hmm. we see at the lottery, right? Like one of the things that we do is that before you can collect your winnings, you know, we're checking to see in cooperation um, with the state government whether or not you owe, uh, owe back child support, mm -hmm. for example or if you owe back taxes. So, you know, you win $10,000, you come through the system, and you've got $3,000 of child support that hasn't been paid. You know, through the lottery and through these other mechanisms, that money can now be swept right out of those uh, winnings and sent back to the Commonwealth and back to the families that need that money. And I think that's an added benefit uh, that sports betting also potentially adds, if it's legalized, is you're also sweeping those other type of uh, delinquent accounts that otherwise would never get addressed if the legal sports betting is the only channel uh, through which people have to engage sports betting. Right. So it's something important to keep in mind. Absolutely. <coughs> Very good. Uh, and so just following up on that, Director Sweeney, so where do you see the lottery's role in this whole discussion of the legalization of sports betting, both online or possibly in a brick and mortar venue only? Uh, whatever the Senate and the House says it is. <laughs> uh, I think it's good for us to have a seat at the table, obviously, and I think Treasurer Goldberg has been vocal about that. Um, similar to the situation when the state legislature was considering casinos, uh, I know the state legislatures and, and gaming commission are protective of the lottery. The lottery does bring in a billion dollars approximately uh, of profit uh, to the Commonwealth and to 351 cities and towns. And so having that voice at the table uh, that Treasurer Goldberg again has, has mentioned in order to have input uh, to make sure that lottery revenues and lottery gaming systems and the integrity aspect uh, is protected is important. Uh, other than that, we work in partnership with both the state legislature uh, and the Mass Gaming Commission uh, and anyone else who has a role in the gaming industry in the Commonwealth. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, we don't view any of this as uh, turf wars, or as negative competition. Uh, it's an opportunity for all of us to up our game, uh, to be competitive mm -hmm. and to be cooperative across the board. Uh, it's the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Right. Uh, and I think that's the way you know, we view the situation yeah. going forward. Just I, to, no, I, can I keep say cutting we, you off. You no, 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 <laughs> I can say we, we, we look at it the same way. And you know, I think we were all very interested at the beginning with our first uh, casino opening, how would that affect the lottery? in the region and in fact it has um, the, the lottery sales because of a strategic uh, agreement with the lottery and the casino that means you know placement where would they be selling them they had you know they signed an agreement that they would um, the numbers have been great They're, the numbers have been great there has not been a loss in revenue in the area because of the casino so I just wanted to, to build off what Mike was saying just in terms of uh, you know working together uh, I can't say enough about 
you, the treasurer, and your team for, again, coming to the table and knowing that, you know, our bill didn't really address a number of the issues you're concerned with, but we're going to work together um, on other things. And, and for, look on the crowd, I see a few of the folks that we worked with here, but from, you know, the casino end, racetracks, you know, the leagues, the, the teams, the gaming commission, certainly, really across the entire industry, everyone has come to the table both before and after we filed our bill, even if we didn't see eye to eye on things. And the same can be said for both the House and the Senate, which gets along pretty well, but sometimes we have our differences. So uh, it's exciting that we're all on the same page and we're going to get the best package possibly passed. I think one thing that lottery is interested in exploring is, and again, I think the state legislature did a great job, as uh, Commissioner Cameron has mentioned, you know, there's a requirement for the physical casino locations uh, to carry and make available lottery products to the customers that are coming within their physical location. And as we continue this discussion about other type of pathways for gambling, particularly sports betting, uh, if the Commonwealth does uh, go in that direction, and if it particularly offers an online or mobile aspect to the sports betting, I think it would be fair for the lottery as well as fair to our casino partners uh, that those new providers have a similar requirement. And how do you meet that requirement uh, of, the, of a physical space, but a physical space in the online world, if you will, right? And so we would hope that if the Commonwealth moves in that direction, uh, it looks at things like uh, allowing for data analytics to be shared by those type of companies with the lottery, mm -hmm. and also provide the lottery with potentially the, the um, ability to do push notifications through those mobile applications, uh, or to access emails, uh, or to perhaps have uh, pop-ups or other advertisements when jackpots get to a certain level. Uh, that's the requirement that the state uh, placed on casinos in a physical location. And again, I just think it would be fair if we're doing a mobile application to have similar requirements apply in the cyberspace world as we do in the physical, uh, physical world. And if, if I could just jump in on the end there, I just want to second what uh, Senator Crichton said, and, and he has been uh, a tremendous resource throughout this entire process. I mean, him and his team have, have jumped both feet in, into this issue and, and looked at it from, from every angle. And, and, you know, of all the bills that I looked at in terms of, uh, I think you, yours was the only one that had a specific prohibition of anyone, any entity that was an illegal offshore betting entity from even uh, participating in what would be the legal process and so you know that level of detail um, and just you know the great friendship and cooperation that I, I, I think it's it's pretty exciting to see this issue move across the country but but as we look in Massachusetts uh, as the director and uh, uh, everyone has kind of echoed is just kind of the partnership on the ability to get into the weeds together and, and really try to try to get it right and and he has certainly done that and that's what I think is going to really make a, wh whatever the final bill comes to be and when it when it happens through the committee process, um, I think it's going to be stronger because of the work that he's done. Thanks. And uh, on that note, I think we're at time. Uh, do we have time for any questions, Mike, or should we just, okay. No time for questions. Thank, thanks to all of our panelists for coming up here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to have that one. Yeah. 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 I feel like we've been here 10 minutes. <laughs> right? We can all talk. Yeah. Yeah. Five minute break. Okay. <laughs> Great. So we're going to begin, and this panel is on regulatory models for sports wagering. I will be moderating the discussion. We will also have time for questions from the audience. The panel includes Kip Levin, the president and COO of FanDuel. Thank you, Kip, for coming all the way out here. Daniel Wallach from Wallach Legal. We talked about Daniel before. Jackie Crum, the executive vice president and general counsel of Encore Boston Harbor and Milton Champion, the executive director of the Maine Gaming Control Board. So this discussion will be about what are the best models for regulating sports gambling and what a panel to have that discussion with. Kip, why don't I start with, I know you're drinking water, so I'll wait, <laughs> sorry. That's right. <laughs> the, um, so so a year, prior to last year, FanDuel was focused on DFS yep. and now you are in a different marketplace or the leading online sports betting platform in New Jersey. How did that work? Obviously, the Supreme Court decision was the pathway there, but that was helpful. Yeah. That was very helpful. Yeah. How does how did having both DFS and, and sports betting work together? Uh, well, I, I actually, we're, we even go a bit broader than that. So we are 
so the FanDuel business has evolved a lot in the last 12 months. Um, I was actually prior to July of last year running the U.S. business for a, one of the big European sports betting operators called Paddy Power Betfair. Um, our business in the U.S. was largely horse racing, actually, which was discussed a bit in the last panel. Um, so we run TVG, which is the biggest online horse racing uh, business as well as the television network in the U.S. Um, we run an online casino business as well in New Jersey called Betfair Casino. Um, and then we basically took those businesses and merged it with, with the FanDuel business um, to, as, as we saw sports betting opening up. Um, our point of view was that uh, the audience we were going after uh, in the sports betting market knew the FanDuel and the DraftKings brands very, very well. Um, and at the same time, FanDuel was looking for expertise around sports betting, which we had. So, um, so it was a great sort of marriage of, uh, of two businesses that were in a lot of different verticals. And if you look at the way the mature operators work in Europe, um, they're in all of those categories between horse racing, which is you know, much more popular in Europe and Australia, where we have other international businesses, uh, you know, obviously sports betting, you know, on all variety of sports, online casino gaming, uh, which is legal in most of those jurisdictions as well. So, um, so it, you know, it's a big step forward, big evolution. And, and look, the, the, the good news is uh, the daily fantasy business is actually still growing. And it's growing, you know, 15, 20% year on year in the rest of the the country and it's growing just as much in, in New Jersey as well, even though a lot of our marketing effort is around uh, promoting the, the FanDuel Sportsbook. Given that experience in New Jersey, what advice, if any, would you have for those from Massachusetts and New Hampshire as they're thinking about this topic? Yeah. Yeah, look, I, I think New Jersey, I was just having a conversation with somebody else about this. New Jersey spent several years getting ready for it, right? Mm -hmm. They you know, had been five years into the online uh, casino gaming business, which was, uh, you know, a lot of learnings there. Um, we'd gone through that journey with them, too. And then, you know, in anticipation that the Supreme Court was going to rule the way they ruled, you know, they had spent time in Europe with us understanding how sports betting works. Um, you know, and I think, uh, you know, I, there's a lot of debates around, you know, retail versus mobile versus, you know, how many operators versus tethering it to a casino or a racetrack, so on. I think, um, I think that the, the critical things that, that they've nailed, right, if, if at the end of the day, you know, the goal is to try to um, go after the illegal market, you know, you have to have mobile, right, and you can't put um, more restrictions in place, and meaning you can't have people having to go sign up at a physical location to then activate a mobile, which is similar to what you have in Nevada, right, because again, you're competing with an illegal market that you don't have to do that, right? It's very, very easy. And you already have, you already have friction in the process through being a regulated operator, right? You're going to have to do KYC, which means, you know, somebody's going to have to enter their social security number and we're going to have to, as an operator, verify that. That's friction that illegal sites don't have to do. Um, you're going to have to be a registered sort of legal operator merchant processor, which means credit cards work half of the time, right? Because a lot of the banks are still trying to figure out whether or not they want to do it. Illegal sites, you know, it works like a normal e-commerce transactions and credit cards work 99% of the time because they have all these tricks that they do to sort of trick the processor. So there's already friction in being a regulated online operator to add more to it. You know, it's just, you're just going to slow down the, the process of, of migrating people mm -hmm. from offshore. Thank you. Dan, in-game wagering. In-game wagering, it's been thought that approximately 40% of betting on mobile devices constitutes in-game wagering, what, what are some of the unique challenges with that versus other types of sports wagering? Well, I think Kip could probably speak uh, more firsthand towards that because it's in his market in New Jersey. And I know traditionally in Europe, the in-game market is probably 70 to 80 percent. It's a little bit less here, but it's growing. But it does kind of tie in nicely with his, with his point, his central point about how essential mobile betting is because without Without mobile betting, you know, the, the real-time ability to bet, uh, you know, nanosecond, you don't have an in-game wagering market. So you need to have mobile. Uh, but it also does underscore the need for reliable data uh, because that's going to drive the entire in-game wagering market. And speed matters. Reliability matters. Accuracy matters. And a lag time creates uh, opportunities for manipulation and could also, um, you, you know, be, be susceptible to manipulation and potentially narrow the window for potential in-game wagering opportunities if, if the delay is too long. So uh, when you're talking in-game, which is going to be a growing part of the landscape, uh, mobile 
and the best data possible, which I view as official data, I think go hand in hand. Uh, In-game in for us is already over 50% of right? our total wager. Is that going up? Is it's it? going up yeah. literally every week. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was probably 30% um, through the NFL season. And uh, you know, since then, I think you know, we've been consistently over 50%. And that, that's even surprised us. I think we would have anticipated it to be lower while people were, st were still trying to figure it out. Um, so. You know, again, I think it's just more proof that you know all of the projections of what the size of the illegal market, you know, the high end is probably right because people knew what they were doing. Right? Like mm -hmm. this, very clearly, people yeah. had experience in, in doing things like in-game betting. Uh, Jackie, you're the Encore Boston Casino is going to is going to, I believe, set to open in June 2019. Scheduled for June 23rd. Scheduled? Okay, and the addition of a sports book will, of course, be a major economic boon to to it uh, you know, in New Jersey I've seen reported figures show 80 percent of total sports legal sports wagering is attributable to remote betting uh, how, how is that going to play if that proves true in Massachusetts as well if people are betting that way rather than physically at the facility what kind of challenges is that uh, place on Encore? I don't think it, ch it poses any additional challenges on us as to as, a, as compared to any other um, operator. I think it's interesting. People come and they visit our facility right now, and most people believe that sports betting is actually legal right now. The first question we get asked is where the sports book is. So once we what explain, what's the answer? <laughs> not yet. <laughs> um, so we fully um, support online uh, sports betting and anticipate that that's a major part of the business. Other thoughts on that? Any, any other reactions? Well, I mean, okay. again, I, I would look back at New Jersey, right? You know, online casino gaming was legalized in 2013. Um, Atlantic City has seen nothing but increased traffic into its casino since then. So Atlantic City was on a multi-year sort of economic decline. Online has actually created new customers who, once they start playing online, are now going into physical casinos when they otherwise wouldn't have. And I think if you ask any of the operators in New, in New Jersey who are running retail, you know, even though it is 80% online, um, they are all seeing increased foot traffic obviously coming into their buildings as a result of having sports books. We also see in Nevada a lot of people actually come into the physical structure and sit there and bet on their phone. Mm. So yeah. it's definitely, I think it's the more convenient tool, um, but they do like to actually be in a physical presence of the the sports facility as well. I mean, we actually see it both ways. We see, we've had days, so we run the sports book at the Meadowlands in New Jersey. We've seen days where you have an hour long line to get in and place a bet at a, at a teller, and people are looking at their app. They're looking at all the odds on their app, but they want to actually use and place a bet with cash and have a physical ticket in their hand and so on. So the two play really well together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that kind of highlights, at least within New England, a little bit of a running debate. You know, Rhode Island, I think, may have some uh, legislation that would require the customer to physically go to a casino and sign up for an online platform, right? So you can bet on your mobile device, but, you know, in some of the jurisdictions, the casino industry doesn't want to totally lose the experience with the customer and the belief is you know make them come into the casino to open up the account and we'll have that kind of stickiness with the customer but if you're going to do mobile the right way I think New Jersey has been a pace setter here and the, the idea that one must sign up for a mobile account at a land-based venue doesn't make any sense to me if you're going to eliminate or tamp down on the black market I think you need to make the mobile experience as easy convenient and accessible as, as possible not just from the moment you make a bet but even uh, even from the very beginning when you're onboarded and signing up for an account. And, and I think we've seen this work in the uh, fantasy sports area. So we know that they can geofence uh, appropriately. We also know that age verification is possible and has been done um, with great success. So we, do, we would support also the remote uh, sign up. Actually, uh, this morning, we had a, so our second, uh, actually our second sports bill was published this morning. The first one was with uh, language to be furnished at a later time. Uh, this one that came out this morning uh, will kind of throw everybody for a loop a little bit on this current discussion because in that bill, and I did look at it relatively quickly this morning before I left and before I had my coffee, so don't hold me to, to too much, <laughs> but um, 
it's basically stating right now that, that there would be sports lounges in the two casinos in Maine and that the Indian, uh, that a Native American tribe could get a license to have mobile. So that's, that's what that bill's coming out, or that, that bill's been published and actually, you know, has to go through the process and everything. But it's just strange how we're having this conversation here and now I'm going to throw another mix into it where we have land base that will not have on or not have online betting but a tribal can offer hmm. online betting so is that the only state that would have that arrangement that you know of that i've seen so far that i've seen so far honestly i, I you know i i moved up to uh maine in 2016 and from florida uh, right pardon from florida yeah it's yeah. too hot down there yeah. <laughs> I wanted, I wanted the snow. You like this weather. I, yeah. like, I like shoveling, <laughs> you know. So, But um, when, I, when I first went up, they said, you know, gee, you used to oversee 27 power mutual facilities. They had seven of them had slots. The, uh, you, you initiated the this first seminal compact and all that sort of thing. Aren't you going to be a little bit bored when you get up to Maine with just two casinos? Well, since then, I've now received uh, nonprofit gaming, which, believe it or not, takes a lot of time, a lot of your time, or at least does mine. Um, from the state police, they transferred it over to our office. Uh, I got surprised last year with fantasy sports, which I'm currently trying to uh, finish up on the rule making. But as most of you know, a, a rule making process, and I had three RFPs last year, so we all know how much time that takes. So everything's kind of like pushed back a little bit. So it's kind of nice that Maine's kind of taken caution to this. And, and I heard that, I think, with Massachusetts as well. You know. We're not we're not in a rush to be out there and be one of the first in this in this case. In fact, in, in either case, uh, we would like other states to mess up, and and you know, have the heat cups and so forth. <laughs> and so th that'll mean less for us in in the later in the later time. So I honestly think that we're we're not really in a rush, and we're looking to hopefully be able to do it right out of the gate. So Milton, your question really brings up the fact that it, in New Jersey. And in Nevada, an operator's ability to offer mobile or online betting requires that there be a partnership with a land-based gaming ven venue. Massachusetts, we heard this in the last panel, those bills do not require that. At least some of them don't. What, is, what are some of the pros and cons of having this requirement that there, that there has to be a, a tethering of a land-based entity and the capacity to, to place a bet online? What, is there a is there a justification for it? Is there is there a policy rationale? Well, I'll tell you what. In, in in my view, and this is strictly my opinion, I started in the industry in Atlantic City in 1980 something. You know, it's like that TV show you watch, 1980 something. Goldbergs, there you go. Um, but anyway, I started in the industry on the gaming side, and I was part of opening five casinos. I worked in eight different jurisdictions. Uh, you know, with eight different uh, commissions and so forth. So when I decided to go to the other side of the hallway in 2006 was when I went to, to work, start working for, for governments and commissions and agencies and <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, you know, I, I just, over the years, I've kind of seen things happen. Like when I left New Jersey in 1991, you know, there was these things called river boats, but they had to go out for 40 minutes and come in for 40 minutes. And then, okay, well, the weather's really bad here, so they can stay dockside. And then all of a sudden a tornado comes through and sends three or four barges about five miles inland. Oh, well, now we can have land base. So I think everything's kind of like a trickle. The other, the, the most recent thing that we're, you know, we, well, maybe not so much recent is the power mutual industry. Okay, and I can definitely speak to that coming from Florida. You know, the, the slot machines were put in to help the power mutuals. Okay, so now we're kind of like seeing where okay, where there was some discussion about uh, brick and mortar, all right? So now are we, are we taking away from the brick and mortar, the visits there, because we're now offering online? You know, people don't have to leave their house now. They can just sit there and play and win and, and make their transactions and everything else. And so, you know, and I know the thought pattern is, well, gee, let's get out. Let's go out tonight. Let's not sit on the couch and eat bonbons and make bets. Let's go and, you know, have some other alternative or entertainment. So I think in, in that retrospect where the casinos and the, or the racinos were brought in to help the paramutuals, 
I think I think uh, sports betting and online betting in effect is is there to maybe help out the casinos themselves so you know I hopefully there's not this drag out hmm. position but you know for the time that I've been in the industry that's kind of what I'm saying I, I mean look, we obviously have a lot of experience with this, I mean, through the TVG business for years and years, talking about the paramutual business, we've had market access partners with various tracks in various states where they make a percentage of our revenue. Uh, you know, obviously our online casino business for the last five years, we've been working with the Golden Nugget Casino in New Jersey. That's a great partnership for us. We actually share best practices. Even though we're online competitors in the space, we share best practices. We, we work together on, you know, talk about what works from a marketing perspective. How are you doing on sort of processing transactions and deposits, et cetera. So that's been beneficial. Uh, you know, it just goes into the general tax discussion for us. Um, you know, if market access through a partnership with a casino, you know, or a track or uh, a tribe or a lottery, um, plus the tax, plus the federal tax becomes too much overall for us to where we can't commercially compete with the illegal market, then it gets problematic. But as long as those things all add up to, in effect, a a reasonable tax rate for us to operate, then you know we're generally fine, and, and you know we will hopefully find the right partners that will be beneficial and additive to the to the business that we're we're doing in that state. Okay, Jack, you're down. No, and I, I agree with Kip. I think the market is large enough to have a number of players in the market and bring in um, the competition that you want to see in order to create the right product. Um, you know, obviously we've got a a vested interest in given the amount that we've spent on our infrastructure and job creation but we know that there are companies like your company and uh, and other fa fantasy sports companies who are not represented here today who um, have also made a substantial investment in uh, in the Commonwealth from our perspective our, our chief focus would be the compliance infrastructure that we have within the bricks and mortar facility uh, we obviously have the surveillance we have the know your customer not to say that other players could not do that but from a regulatory perspective, we see that as um, advantageous to the regulators to have a to have one place to go and and uh, be able to um, assess everyone's compliance uh, from a responsible gaming perspective and also um, uh, yeah yeah I, I think in that respect, Governor Baker's bill and I believe Senator Crichton's bill is transformational, as is the New Hampshire bill. Uh, it would be the first. Uh, those, those would be the first jurisdictions to untether uh, online platforms from land-based casinos and really open up the market. I mean, I don't know how many uh, vendors will be in New Hampshire, but in Massachusetts, having an open marketplace will spur competition, innovation, provide better choices for consumers, and I think will capture a larger overall percentage of the market if you give customers the maximum amount of cho choices rather than say, okay, you have to find a partnership with one of the three casinos in Massachusetts. New York has some similarities. New York has four upstate casinos, and unlike New Jersey, uh, New York, the bills that have been introduced in New York contemplate only one skin per casino or only one online brand per casino. That doesn't, that, doesn't, that, that, that doesn't provide the consumer with nearly the same number of options and choices as an open marketplace would, which I think would lead to an overall better product and would spur innovation, create competition, and really be to the betterment of, of the state and to, the, and, and to consumers. I've read that 97% of betting on sports in the United States is through some sort of unlawful means. And if that's true, obviously it's gonna go down as states begin to permit betting on sports, but how do we deal with the public health considerations? Uh, if people become addicted to gambling, if people bet too much, and this was alluded to in one of the earlier questions, what mechanisms should be in place to address that topic? Well, I think, first of all, the legalization of that, it, it gives you the data that you need yeah, in order yeah. to review what's yeah. actually going on. Uh, what's happening right now is, of course, you have people who nobody's capturing that information, and uh, you're losing people in that process. Uh, particularly with online sports wagering, tracking of that data makes it incredibly easy to identify patterns and uh, problems. And we certainly have the, the mechanisms in place within the Commonwealth to provide assistance, to direct them to the appropriate facilities. Um, there's, there's a very fine line between reaching out to someone and saying you've got a problem and identifying them and leading them and providing them with the right tools. And I think 
uh, particularly with online, it's, it's incredibly easy to do, more so than it is probably in a bricks and mortar regular facility. Yeah, it's interesting. Everybody associates online with an increased risk in uh, in responsible gambling, you know, and issues with that. And, you know, we've said that for years and years and years in the horse racing business, right? Like, you know, with online, you know, ADW, which has been around forever, it's exactly right, right? Like, we've got, you know, a, all of our customer service agents are trained in responsible gambling. They go through mandatory annual training around best practices to listen to customers. You know, they can monitor behavior. So the same thing, like we monitor um, how much people are depositing and spending. We monitor for sort of changes in, in mm -hmm. behavioral patterns and, and so on. And, and, you know, we're doing that now in New Jersey and translating that in. And you can't do that in retail, right? Because if somebody's, we have 30 retail tills in mm -hmm. the Meadowlands in New Jersey. Somebody can go up to a different tell her every time they'd have no idea how much that money that person's putting through. Kip, as I understand it, right now there's self-reporting by mm -hmm. operators. Is that enough for compliance issues? Should no, I mean, there I be a governmental entity that's much more rigorous and that maybe requires records being shared? I, I know that in the state of live free or die, that, that, that kind of tenor isn't always popular, but you ought to ought it to be. I, look, I, th I think you know, a regulated, licensed operator has to be held to a standard, right? We certainly hold ourselves to a very serious standard, and, and you know, those standards are, are what need to be sort of upheld by the regulators in any jurisdiction. And so that means, right, like, you know, somebody online or retail, right, to the extent that we can track it in retail, but it's much, much harder. But so to simplify it, online, right, once somebody has, you know, lost or deposited over a certain amount of money, we do a man. We, we will freeze that account, and we'll do a mandatory. But we need another sort of proof of wealth um, check from that person before we'll let them continue on any further, right? And so there's a number of hurdles. Like we have, you know, I think we were actually the first online casino operator where we were putting um, ads on television in New Jersey um, that talked about all the responsible gambling mechanisms that worked within the app. So the ability to go in and when you sign up for an account, you can actually put limits on how much you can deposit into your account every month. Right. So you can set that, you know, you can go in and you can do a 30 day freeze, you can do a 60 day freeze, you can do a 90 day freeze. So there's a lot of things that you can do using technology that sort of give people the guardrails that, you know, they might need. But at the end of it too, right, you also have to remember it's one percent of the population of, of people who are, you know, playing online gaming that have a problem. But again, we take that very seriously. Uh, Milton, Jack, you're Dan, any any yeah. Yeah, well, Okay, no, one, one thing that I could see states doing more of is earmarking the percentage of tax collections associated with sports betting revenues to help problem gamblers and compulsive gamblers. And I believe New Hampshire um, is actually a pace setter in that regard by creating, I guess, some kind of a fund. Is it 10% of the you know, uh, tax collections from sports betting? Very few, not that many other states mandate a percentage of, of tax revenues to go to help, uh, you know, problem gamblers. So there are all sorts of programs that cost money that states can, uh, you know, really um, assist through this, you know, mandate in the state law that, one, you don't see in the black market. There are no, you know, props, compulsive gambling safeguards uh, when you're dealing with offshore sites. But some of the first mover states, I don't believe, have done nearly enough to ensure that um, proceeds cash, money, be directed into programs as a mandate under the state law. And I, I'd li I like that New Hampshire is taking a leadership position in that regard with what I think is probably the highest benchmark so far, which is 10 percent. We didn't pay you to say that either. We no. <laughs> I, I, I do think that the other but, thing that's but, critical you know, is you, yeah. it, the operators have to have, there needs to be a uniform uh, exclusion list, right? Like if somebody excludes and they're permanently excluded, it all has to go into one list. That yeah. person, if they say, you know what, it I have a problem, I shouldn't be doing right. this, yeah. you know, it, it shouldn't just be with us, right? It should take to put them on a list that then other operators have to make sure that that person can't come in and sign up for an account on another operator. Yeah. That's critical. And Massachusetts has done that very well in just in terms of the regular land-based casinos right now, um, as opposed to someplace like Nevada, for instance, where you can exclude from one hotel and walk in next door mm -hmm. and keep going. Um, I think in, in answer to your question about availability of information, too, um, everyone who's familiar with gaming recognizes that we have what's called a privilege license. So the regulator has full jurisdiction and control over what information is required and provided. And um, that's why I think 
going back to getting out of the black market and having that regulatory authority um, makes all the difference. Let's talk about integrity fees or sports betting right and integrity fees as the NBA has termed them. So the NBA, Major League Baseball, and the PGA Tour have been asking state lawmakers, including perhaps some in this room, to include a provision in legislation requiring that betting companies pay the leagues a royalty or rights fee, depending upon how you want to term it, of a quarter of a percent on all wagers. Reactions? Not our bill. Well, we, we believe, you know, the leagues should maintain the integrity of the sporting event. Um, the, the operators should maintain the integrity of the sports wager. So they're, they're already required to make sure that the sporting event is, um, has the integrity. Yeah, I'll let Dan respond. Yeah, he uh, wants, clearly wants to jump in. You know, uh, somebody <laughs> coined the term integrity fee, and it's obviously stuck over the past year. I think the premise of it is a royalty and a rights fee that, that is built upon three pillars. Pillar number one, they create the product that is commercially exploited by others without sports. There's no sports betting. Number two, uh, the leagues, by virtue of this expansion, dramatic ex expansion of sports betting nationwide, will be incurring additional expense. There's no question about it. They'll have to ramp up you know, monitoring, investigative arms, education. They're going to be spending more out of pocket and not just on lobbyists. Number three, if you expand sports betting nationwide, even if you regulate it, you increase the risk factor associated with the integrity of the game. I know uh, when, you, when you create a state-centric uh, system of regulation, in an ideal world, if you're just migrating everything over from the black market into legal regulated markets, yeah, the leagues have a lower level of exposure. But most, I think a, a significant part of the new uh, betting landscape consists of bettors who have not been betting in the black market. So I think as you proportionally increase the amount of betting, there's a concomitant, concomitant increase. I don't know if I said the right, the right, the word I'm correctly. Not sure either. There's an increase in the risk factor, although I think state level regulation provides a detection system. But at the front end, I think there's also incentivization and, and risk associated with more people trying to, and increase the num number of people who might try to corrupt the game, either by acquiring information or so forth. And then take those three factors and look at another segment of the gaming industry, which is horse racing. The pillar of horse race why, revenues. Why hasn't Nevada ever required this? Well, that was 1949, and that's a fair point that the casino industry raises. It's been like that for, you know, 60, 65, 70 years. But to go from one state to 50 states, potentially, I don't think that that is a public policy justification for keeping the status quo. And I will add that under federal law in horse racing, uh, we have something known statewide. We have race books. You can, go, you can go into a casino that has a race book, and you can bet on uh, horse racing taking place at out-of-state racetracks. Well, the host or the, the, the guest track, which is the race book, has to pay the host track a, you know, a percentage of the handle. It's not, it's not specified in the law as a percentage of the handle, but it is a consent-based requirement where the guest track has to have the host track's permission to be able to allow wagering on the host track's race. And that is what I consider if, uh, a, a similar system to what the leagues have been asking for as the creator of the content. And they are incurring a, an outsized risk relative to horse race operators who are getting the same thing under federal law. So I don't think the idea of a royalty for the creator of the content is so uh, you know pathbreaking. It already exists in horse racing, and for some of the larger public horse racing companies like Churchill Downs, more than half of their uh, publicly reported horse race racing revenues are attributable to host fees that they get from the OTB sites. The um you strengthen your argument on this one, since we always debate this when we're on panel <laughs> together. Well, um, you, you got me last time. I went to <laughs> I had to do a little research. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, <laughs> So the, the one thing I'll push back, and, and, and this is the position that we take on this topic, right? Like we, we don't disagree that there should be some commercial relationship between the operators and the leagues slash content providers and so on. Um, we just don't believe that the rates should be written in, in a statute. Um, and, and actually, in most states in horse racing, 
Um, it isn't actually written into the state level statutes about what the rate should be. There are a few exceptions where it is that way, and it, you know, we argue that it shouldn't be that way. It's a commercial negotiation. So in the horse racing business, right, we have an annual debate, you know, slash negotiation with the, the host tracks everywhere about what the rate is mm -hmm. going to be. And, you know, over time, you know, it's settled into what, you know, we feel to be sort of reasonable rates, you know, based on what we're willing to pay and, and mm -hmm. you know, what they're willing to receive. So, so we, we, view, we view the leagues getting something that, sort of in the same way. And actually, we have relationships now with the NBA and the NHL where we have, we're making payments to them through commercial things and we're getting other commercial things in return, like the data, right, which we use for our in-play, like the access to be able to buy advertising on their official media sources and so on. So, so we're not necessarily against the concept of it. We just don't think that it should be dictated, you know, or set on a rate, you know, quarter point, whatever it is, in a statute. Should and betting? We, oh, sorry, Jackie. No, I was going to say we agree with that. We think there's just ample room to monetize that through commercial relationships rather than a regulatory, yeah. you know, yeah. statutory. Uh, I, I do want to speak to the commercial relationships issue for a second. FanDuel, DraftKings, Win. those are the kinds of companies that will enter into and have entered into commercial relationships with the leagues. I don't believe that they represent the risk here. The risk is that as we nationalize sports betting and have double digits numbers of operators on a state by state basis, uh, what we're seeing in commercial agreements so far is just really the cream of the crop companies entering into commercial deals. MGM has deals with three out of the four leagues. FanDuel, the Stars Group, I would expect Win probably buys their official data from the leagues. If they don't, they probably will. And if you were look, if you were to look more broadly across the spectrum and just do an operator by operator, you know, checklist uh, in all of the legal regulated states, I think the number of um, operators and in, in, uh, licensed, you know, gaming companies that offer sports betting that have deals in place with the leagues to buy data or to monetize it somehow is probably less than, you know, less than 30 percent. So it, it, it's, it's a great concept. If every company were to enter into a commercial relationship with the leagues, we wouldn't be here having this discussion. But only very few have so far, and the vast majority have not. Should betting companies be required to use leagues' official data? I think there are other reputable companies. I mean, we've seen this happen in Europe. There are reputable companies who are producing this data in Europe. Um, so non-official. I, I don't know why, why it needs to be a monopoly. Okay. Yeah, I mean, look, we, we, we would prefer, obviously, if the leagues were, you know, we, we would like the leagues to have multiple official data providers so that at least there's, you know, we can go negotiate with several and it isn't run like a monopoly, you know, but it also depends on how you're going to run your business, right? And if you're going to be a, just a small niche operator and so on, like maybe you don't need to be an official partner, right? Like you're just going to be small and regional. I think the other way to look at it is in play, right? Like we run on any you know given NBA game, for example, you know we run 250 different bet types per game, sort of like Super Bowl level prop bets on every game, and we run probably a hundred different um, bet types in play. Right? Most operators don't come close to that volume, so for them. Having official, you know, live data might not be as commercially important to, to run their business. Yeah, I mean, if you're not in the in-game wagering market, you don't need official data. But we're assuming that most of the operators will be offering in-game wagering to their patrons. And the choice is, do you want the fastest, most reliable official data source, or do you want courtsiders coming into arenas and scraping data, and they buy them from, uh, you know, some third party? The latency or lag time of even a few seconds can be prone to manipulation, could also narrow the, uh, the betting opportunity because the market will be closed during the time lag. Uh, so if it's just a matter of price, if the leagues were to give this away for free, there's no question every single operator would want it. Uh, so that does beg the question, how, how do you ensure that there's fairness and parity and equity in the pricing? And some of the legislation that I've seen uh, that would be worth modeling would be the requirement in New York that it be set on commercially reasonable terms. And that judgment would be in the discretion of the State Gaming Commission. So there are, there are uh, mechanisms in place to ensure that the NFL isn't just simply saying to FanDuel, you can have our official data for you know, $20 million. There are, there are some uh, um, statutory requirements, at least in some of the bills that are in the pipeline, that I think ensure that uh, there would be some criteria 
by which the operator and the league would be able to find the right strike point on a price. And certainly, leaving it up to the Gaming Commission as the final arbiter is the ultimate uh, you know, resolution to ensure that the operators aren't being taken advantage of from a price perspective. So I think there is, uh, you know, in the best possible world, you want everyone using uh, the most reliable and accurate data and not having that kind of uh, discrepancy. There could be antitrust implications as well based on some of, some of what I just heard. I mean, we'll, we'll find out. But uh, I want to leave. I, 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 just one other point on that. I think it's interesting that, you know, the, the official data feed and, and people say, you know, things like, you know, it's ripe for manipulation and, you know, it's problematic and it leads to integrity challenges. At the end of the day, it's actually the betting operator who's taking on the risk mm -hmm. and has, has the most to risk by not having a, um, you know, low latency, you know, highly accurate feed, you know, from like, I mean, we have our sort of famous example where we had a glitch in our feed during an NFL game and somebody placed a $100 bet that should have paid $20 right. in profit and, it, and because we had a glitch in our feed, it paid eighty-two thousand dollars. You honored it. Too. We honored right. it out. So, at the end of the day, we're we're financially incented to go out and, and cut commercial deals again if we want to run that type of, of betting. Mm -hmm. Milton, did you, I, I want to leave time for questions. So, let's start with questions. Uh, as more states roll out mobile, <clears throat> and as you say, if they allow them to be untethered, so then it's not wild west, but there's a lot of players. You have to break through the clutter. How do we prevent the UK, um, Italy, issues where there are so many advertisements to break through the noise yeah. that it becomes a real regulatory issue? Is that up to you to do that, or is that going to be someone in the government legislating? Uh, look, I, I think you know we have those conversations ongoing again I'm, I'm on the board of the AGA there's a group of the AGA that's sort of looking at advertising best practices sort of putting out sort of pillars of this is how you should be thinking about advertising as we're talking to large media companies we're talking to the leagues and the teams you know we're being clear look I, I get that everybody sort of has big dollar signs in their eyes but like we need to do this in a, in a responsible way right and we can't I, I mean I wasn't in the daily fantasy business five years ago when it sort of came out of it, but <coughs> we've already sort of learned that lesson once through sort of the early days of daily fantasy, and, and that didn't go very well. So, um, so I think w we are absolutely aligned, you know, from an operator standpoint. From I think, you know, the the league's perspective, you know, the, the media companies are um, just trying to figure it out, and and I think, you know, certainly we would hope that. They will be on board with moderating how much advertising they're taking, right? Because I, I agree. Like, we do not want to see games flooded. We do not want to see in-game advertising. I mean, we have a we have a deal with the New Jersey Devils where we're doing certain things um, during the game on the jumbotron, but we're being cautious about what we're putting out there, knowing like they're kids, they're young, they're teenagers at the games, and we want to make sure that we're we're doing this in the, in the right way. Yeah, and we get we get inquiries too. I mean, not a lot. But it's like, uh, can you go to the UK and get my jackpot for me? They won't pay me, mm -hmm. you know. And so, me, I, I'm not going to have any regulatory oversight or anything like that. In fact, I think if anything, that'd be more of a, a federal thing. But I don't want to say that too much. You know? <laughs> um, but you're, you're exactly right. There's info, everybody's online all over the place, so it, it's going to be hard. Yeah, that's a good question, Justin. So if, if leagues were to get an integrity fee or royalty fee or whatever else you want to call it, and this is in the highly regulated world of gaming where everybody is licensed and background checked and cross-referenced and everything else, wouldn't the leagues have to go through that same process and would they? Well, they're not. Uh, I, I can't speak to Massachusetts law, but uh, when you see revenue, revenue shares in certain states require licensing. This isn't revenue. This is not tied to the gaming activity where they're taking wagers. They're not supplying equipment. They're not distributing, uh, you know, gaming related services. It's just, you know, just off the top. I don't think that that would uh, necessi necessitate a licensing situation. This is the first that I've, uh, that I've heard of it. If they were, if they were sharing in revenues, uh, in certain states, maybe that would require some kind of licensing, but the percentage that they're seeking is based upon, you know, the handle, um, not not the hold. The, it's a it's a good question because, actually, if you think about uh, so taking New Jersey as an example, if you're a marketing affiliate, which means you have a marketing relationship with us where 
we pay you for a new customer sign up and then we pay you a percentage of that customer's revenue on a go forward basis, um, you have to get licensed as an affiliate, right? So what you're saying is true that technically by regulation in New Jersey, if the league were to strike a commercial agreement with us where they were getting a percentage of uh, of revenue or even handle, yeah. they would have to get licensed as an affiliate. Yeah, and, and licensing is a function of either regulations issued by a gaming commission or state statutes. State statute, statutes can say whatever they want, and if, if a particular state were to uh, enshrine within a uh, sports betting law a requirement that um, the leagues receive a quarter of a point, uh, the, the, the legislation could say that this does not constitute a situation that would require a licensure. So I think that would be addressed um, in, in, in a state statute. Uh, if it's silent, the assumption would mean that there's no requirement to be licensed. I know if you're in New Jersey and you're getting a revenue share as an affiliate, you've got to get a casino service industry enterprise license. If you get it on a per head basis, uh, not a revenue share, but based upon some other revenue model, uh, you know, just the cost per head, then you just register as a vendor. So it really does differ from state to state, and it's within the prerogative of the state to determine how and under what circumstances, uh, you know, fees like this get paid. Then when you look at licensing and individuals, are you going to start fining the player for throwing a game, for, for yeah. the ball being not inflated yeah. enough? Well, yeah, but, but I think that kind of conflates things. I mean, when you talk <laughs> about integrity, though, right? You're yeah. talking about integrity now. We're, we're, but we're talking would, about a royalty. But that, I would think yeah. that they, that they, in and of themselves, as they're going to present a game, do we not hold the casinos responsible for that? For those uh, deck of cards being 52 deck or 52 cards in a deck? Okay, so what's the difference with, you know, making sure it's like taking a knee? How much did the NFL lose with that? But, but, with that but Milton, that deal, the uh, gambling know, so. companies are offering a gambling type product. The leagues are providing a sport, and but in they, the, in but the they notion, they can remove some of the cards from the deck and not make <laughs> it, not make it, yeah. uh, you know, a, a, a integrity situation, or not make yeah. it a, a, a game. I know, but, but, but certainly in your so. example, Justin, the <laughs> leagues play absolutely no yeah, role. In the, in the gambling aspect yeah. of it. They're not supplying any equipment. <coughs> uh, they're not accepting wages. It's just passive receipt of a percentage, a small percentage of the overall handle. And I don't think that places them close to the you know, inner workings of a gambling operation that would kind of require the type of licensing to ensure you know, stakeholder integrity. I think it's far enough removed from having a stake in the profits to disassociate the leagues from a licensing situation uh, that's yeah, I'm certainly not suggesting and I'm just yeah. saying that when you when you use the word license now you're now you're into a whole different category because we use license in the nonprofit side we use license we use registration mm -hmm. okay license a lot a lot more stringent of a, of a procedure than just registering something so when you get into that you want to be kind of a little bit cautious I would think at least I, mm -hmm. I would be okay we have time for one more question Thank you. The question was for Kip, and if you covered this already, pardon me, but given your experience in New Jersey and on the earlier panel, we heard about potentially an approach in Massachusetts would be online licensing only versus tethered, but what's your company's philosophy on the importance of bricks and mortar and online together? How does that work out? Yeah, I, I think um, uh, we've obviously had great success with the Meadowlands and the business there, you know, we view, um, we, you know, we view our, our parent company in, in Europe, Paddy Power, runs 650 betting shops between Ireland and the UK. So we have retail in our DNA. Um, and, and we think that the businesses, you know, for us in New Jersey have been very complimentary. So, so even in a state where, you know, we potentially would be, you know, able to get an online license, I think we would still pursue potential partnerships where, um, you know, where we could also be in the retail business because, again, it's, you know, we think the two go very well sort of hand in hand. I mean, customer, like sports betting is very social, right? And it's, um, you know, people want to be doing it with their friends and being in an environment. Sports bars are very cultural here, right? And so, um, you know, you see the, the, you know, the atmospheres that are created in, in Las Vegas and we've, you know, been lucky enough to, to create that at the Meadowlands. So, I think as we go from state to state to state, you know, we, we're excited about the potential for finding the right retail partners um, in jurisdictions. And, 
you know, looking forward to it. By the way, there was another thing discussed as I'm thinking about going to our retail location tomorrow for the kickoff of March Madness. You know, I think it's also important on the, this is dovetails over to the NCAA point. Um, the NCAA has been um, way bigger for us than we would have thought. We always knew that it was a large part of the handle in Nevada. We weren't necessarily sure that it would translate to be that big in New Jersey. You know, I think it's between 30 and 40 percent of our total business so far. I mean, college football was almost as big as NFL. Um, college basketball, even before the tournament started, has been bigger than the NBA for the last couple of weeks. I mean, as we talk um, about amateurism in sports, right? <coughs> the idea that they're not, you know, they're just students. That right there, just I mean, it's, reaffirms it's, the point well, that they're definitely you know, been shocking. For and us if to you see. are, if, if you are trying to get people off the black market, I think so you have to the point. that because yeah. the point I was going to make is if people will go back and forth. Then. Yeah, or, or, or they won't, the right? Market. They're just going to stay. Yeah. They're going They'll to just stay, stay in the black market yeah. because they want to have all their activity in one, in place. one place. And so if you're thinking about carving it out, like you're, you are, even if you've got untethered mobile, yeah. free access mobile, you are going to keep a large portion of right. the illegal market in the illegal market by carving that out. And on the integrity point, again, was made, like integrity should be getting better with legalization, right? Like we're part of SWIMA in New Jersey. Like we're all working together to share the data. Like, the NCA is going to need to realize that by partnering and working with legal operators and combating and moving people out of the illegal market, you are ultimately going to make integrity safer for the sport. Thank you. Thank you all very much. What a great event. Thank you for attending. Thanks for the amazing speakers. Charlie, great keynote. And we will have a reception right down there. If you walk out of here.